Good morning. Uh, welcome uh, to our members uh, and uh, to the public to the 27th meeting in 2013 of the Health and Sport Committee. And as usual, uh, can I remind those present um, uh, to switch off mobile phones and Blackberries? I don't know where Blackberry is going to be around for too long. He's changed the script, I think. Um, but um, the to other, uh, to turn off the wireless devices as they often interfere with the sound system. Um, members of the public may also notice that we are, the members of the committee are using tablet devices and, and this is instead of uh, hard, hard copies of our, our papers. Um, we have continued apologies from Richard Simpson and uh, Malcolm Chisholm is again with us uh, as a, uh, today as a Labour Party substitute. The first item on the agenda um, today is subordinate legislation and we have three negative instruments to consider. The first instrument, um, Official Labelling Scotland Regulations 2013 SSI 2013-254. There has been no, um, no motion to annul uh, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on this instrument. Are there any comments from members? No, I therefore put the question on SSI 2013-254 that the committee has no recommendations to make. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The second instrument before us is the Glasgow Commonwealth Games Enforcement Officers Regulations 2013, SSI 2013-258. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Are there any comments from members? I will therefore put the question on SSI 2013-258 that the committee has no recommendations to make. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The third and final instrument is the Glasgow Commonwealth Games Games Locations Order 2013 SSI 2013-259. Uh, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on this instrument. Are there any comments from members? I will therefore put the question on SSI 2013-259 that the committee has no recommendations to make. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much for that. We now move to agenda item number two, um, um, which is to continue our evidence taking at stage one of the Public Bodies, Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill. And can I give a warm welcome to our first panel of the day, uh, Claire Cairns, uh, Network Coordinator, the Coalition of Carers in Scotland, and Pam Duckett, uh, Duncan, Policy Officer, Independent Living in Scotland, uh, Ian Welsh, um, Chief Executive Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, and Karen Hamilton, Borders Public Partnership Forum. Welcome to you all. Uh, I propose, uh, in the interest of time, to go directly to questions, and our first question is to Rhoda. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the criticisms we've had with the bill that it concentrates on bureaucracy rather than principles and outcomes. Can I ask if you think that the bill is sufficiently well drafted to involve carers and service users um, meaningfully? And if not, what could be added to the bill to make that happen? Yeah. Um. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to um, give evidence today. Um, we, we very much appreciate it. And also to say at the top of our, our, our evidence session that disabled people welcome um, the integration of services um, of social care and health in the hope that they will, uh, they will result in a seamless provision um, for, for people for those services. Um, we, we believe that the principles in the bill are good, but that we think they could be strengthened in terms of um, making a clear statement that the integration is about the delivery of services for people um, and the experiences that, that they have. In this vein, we would, we would suggest that 
um, something be in, included in the bill um, are akin, akin to the principles that were added to the SDS Act earlier in the year um, around independent living. Um, health and social care are absolutely essential material supports for disabled people to participate in society and lead an ordinary life. Without those, without health and social care, many disabled people cannot participate in society. I couldn't get out of bed this morning or come to give evidence today without good social care um, that, that was um, accessible and that I could control. Um, and equally, the health services that I, that I access as a disabled person are essential for me to be able to to, to live and, 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 and cope with my condition, frankly. Um, and so these things need to be considered in the, the context of equality and human rights. And we believe fundamentally that they are an infrastructure that is essential to deliver the equality and human rights of disabled people. And so in that vein, we think that the Scottish Government could really um, put their head above the parapet and lead the way, in fact, in Europe um, in terms of this and include something in the bill that um, specifically related um, health and social care to the right of disabled people to participate in society and lead an ordinary life. Uh, to, 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 to answer to the point, and this is a, a piece of enabling legis legislation, as, as you know, so that there's uh, much that's not going to be uh, on the face of the bill. Uh, the, the one thing that ought to be in the face of the bill uh, is uh, a, a determination to apply human rights principles. And, and we'll certainly be bringing forward with partners uh, an amendment to that effect. E even though the, the legislation that sets up the Scottish Parliament does enshrine human rights legislation, we believe that it it's, uh, embeds it further in the Scottish context to have that on the face of the bill. Um, I, th I think it's, it's important uh, to, to say uh, uh, that the, the commitment to, to health and social care integration as described in the bill is absolutely the right thing. It's also important to say the commitment of the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, has been uh, exemplary, uh, in my view. We're not in the same party, by the way, uh, but his commitment to, to this has been exemplary. Uh, I think the, the challenge, however, Rhoda, to, to, to come to your point, uh, is that uh, back in the, 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 the places where action is going to take place, uh, and the health boards and the, the, the nascent health and social care partnerships. There will be inevitably, in my view, a, 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 a kind of um, default position whereby structures and budgets take prominence. Uh, now, the jury is out as to whether or not then the vast array of supporting guidelines, which do pay significant uh, um, um, attention to the rights of carers, to the rights of disabled people, to the rights of people with long-term conditions, to the principles of co-production, to the, the principles of putting people at the centre of services. That's a, those supporting guide and the principle of uh, fundamentally redesigning your services in the context of public service reform. The danger is that we never get to that point uh, in, in the new health and social care partnerships. So, the strength of the legislation is that it offers the local partnerships the flexibility to get on with it. The weakness is, uh, in my view, that the health and social care partnerships may simply default to a bureaucratic uh, transition. And pa Pam talked about seamless transition. That was a phrase I used when, when, when I was in local government. We always used to talk about seamless transitions. The, the, the danger here is that we do get a seamless transition that we don't get a, a, um, a fully thought out a, a approach to the philosophy of delivering services in a new way locally. Not just a cheaper way, but a much more inclusive way. And that's the opportunity, in my view, that will be lost if uh, the new health and social care partnerships don't go beyond the, the, the words in the bill, and, but get into the supporting guidelines that will encourage them to make the third sector, particularly the individual, fully, uh, fully a partner in the process. So does that, does that answer? Your, I mean, does that help answer your question? How, I mean, we obviously have to amend the bill to make it work properly. I mean, you're saying the guidelines are moving, and in fact, the, the, the I suppose the sentiment behind the bill is moving in the right direction as well. How can we amend the bill to make it focus on the things that you're saying is important? That's a challenge for us. <coughs> Can, can, just, it would be helpful, Ian, if you go through the chair, because I, I, I don't, don't think... No, it's fine, it's fine. But Claire and Karen may have wished to respond to the, 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 the first... I don't know if you do or not, and don't feel any pressure if you don't, but uh, if you wish to respond to the first part of Rhoda's question, it may be helpful for the rest of the committee. Uh, 
Yeah, that would be great, thanks. We also welcome the outcome focus of the bill and the principles of involving carers as well and strengthening that involvement. Uh, we do feel it could be strengthened in various ways. We held uh, quite a lot of consultation with carers when the first proposals came out around integration. And this was one thing that they felt was absolutely essential for the integration to be successful. Having um, not just care engagement, but meaningful care engagement and really moving more towards co-production than talking about involvement. Um, and there's several ways I think that that could be strengthened, maybe not necessarily through changes to the bill, but also when you look at the guidance and regulations as, as those develop. Um, but some things which uh, carers put forward were, first of all, recognising carers as equal partners. Um, they're recognised as equal partners in the care strategy and as partners in care in the Community Care and Health Act. Um, and I think it's important that there's a reference to that within uh, legislation or certainly within guidance and regulations because it's important to realise that, that carers are also service providers. And so in terms of their views being taken into account, that needs to be equal to other providers who are paid workers. Um, one quote from our consultation is, if integration embraces carers, it should get better, but it won't if it's an afterthought. And so it's all about ensuring carers are involved in all the structures from the top down. And certainly at the minute, there is a question mark in whether carers will be represented um, on partnership boards and whether they'll have voting rights. I know that that's something which has been discussed. It's something which carers overwhelmingly want, um, but it's also something that requires to be resourced. Um, there's quite a bit of mention of resourcing the third sector to get involved, but there's little mention of resourcing carers' involvement or service user involvement. Um, and I think that's essential if, um, as carers keep saying, engagement needs to be meaningful. And we're talking about carers, you're talking about a wide community of people. Um, so in order to capture those views, it may be a young carer, it may be um, an older person looking after a partner, it could be a range of um, illnesses, disabilities, conditions. So to get that information and to feed that into the process is quite difficult and needs resourcing. One, um, we've put together best practice engagement standards and so our way forward would be very much to use the expertise that's there already through care centres and to have a network of uh, forums where the representatives can go back to as a community of carers in order to feed their views through. But again, like I say, that needs resourcing. Some other ways to maybe strengthen things is, as Ian said, to mention co-production rather than consultation. It's really important that um, carers as well as other key stakeholders feel they have an ownership of this and not that they're just at the table um, as an afterthought or they're not there from the beginning. So we would also recommend that they have a role in um, signing off the plans, either through a local care organisation. I'm sure there's been talk about interface organisations also signing off the plans, but we would see that being a role as well for care organisations. Um, yeah, and just sort of another quote from our consultation to kind of finish with is maybe, um, and we heard this a lot, and it's good to talk, but it's more important to be listened to. And so I know a lot of this, like I say, is about um, as integration goes through in the bill that we then look at the sort of uh, guidance and regulations, but I think it's important to have this discussion and this thought from the beginning. Carmen, do you wish to respond? I don't think I have anything further to add to what my colleagues have already said. Um, I think Rhoda mentioned about bureaucracy in the first part of her question, and I, I can appreciate that um, a bureaucratic framework is um, part of the of the process. Um, and I think without without wanting to support that, I think without the relevant structures in place and people knowing exactly who they're responsible to and who they're accountable to and how the chain of command works, for example, I don't think the, um, the process is going to succeed. I think that's been one of the issues in previous attempts that um, it's been a bit muddy about who actually holds the resources, how you transfer funds and so on. So that, that's really the only comment I would say. Yes, it is bureaucratic, but I think up to a point it probably needs to be to make it work. Ian yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just, uh, Rhoda, I mean, we, all of us will bring forward a range of am uh, amendments. One particular one, for example, in relation to engagement, we would be suggesting that insufficient uh, engagement, for example, should be grounds for ministers not to approve the integration plan. So, you know, that's, that would be a mechanistic way of ensuring that uh, the local partnerships were obliged to, many of whom do have first-class engagement plans, uh, Chair, I have, I have to say, but that would be a way for, 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 uh, for ministers to hold local partnerships to account for lack of engagement. So we'll be bringing that as an amendment with, with, with others. 
Um. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for the second opportunity on the, on the same question. Um, in, in response to how, how could we amend the bill, we, we have a, a few suggestions, as I'm, I'm sure you'll probably imagine, um, but one of them is specifically to lift some of the text from the UNCRPD, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, um, and to, to include it um, in the considerations in preparing integration plans, so in Section 3 of the bill. Um, and we've put in quite a, quite a bit of thought as to how that could fit in nicely. Um, and I think that, as I said earlier on, I think that would be a good step for Scotland to take to show that it is taking um, human rights um, seriously um, and that it is very much about putting health and social care, uh, putting people at the front of health and social care rather, um, rather than bureaucracy. Um, the other two, two things I just wanted to make on those points, one of them is around portability. Um, and, and the principles of the bill. Um, we, we know that uh, if, if it is to be about the individual themselves, then, then it seems at odds that, that there would be any barriers to being able to move around within local authorities, particularly that in new integrated systems, we could have 32 different systems, one, one health board covering two or three different social care areas, for example, or local authorities. And so we think that there's an opportunity again here um, to iron out some of the concerns that have been raised um, quite, quite in frequently um, from disabled people about the, the impact of moving from one local authority to another. We think that there's a potential for quite a lot of confusion um, unless we use the opportunity to, to try and address that. And again, we, can, um, we, we have some, some ideas on how we could, we could strengthen that in terms, of, in terms of the bill. And then finally, the, in terms of co-production, um, we, we've recently published um, a toolkit called All Together Now, which is about working in co-production with disabled people. Um, it's, it's been endorsed by um, the Cabinet Secretary as, as a really useful um, piece, piece of tool, um, basically, um, to have in your box in terms of being able to, to make these integration plans work. And um, like Ian said, we would, we would want to see that that become an integral part of whether or not the plans were signed off. And we think that toolkit, for example, could really help um, people to get it right and, and help people engage with the process. I suppose the, the hard question, because we're familiar with many of these themes, what in this legislation is going to deliver those recurring themes that we've heard from you in the past? How will this get the outcomes that you would, be, you would want? How will it get that shift from the power of local government and the health board to... How, how will this bill bring that about that shift of power around? Well, that's a that's a large question, Chair, and, and I, I would say, I, I would, as a seasoned campaigner, uh, who's who's worked <coughs> locally, I sit in the health board now, and I, I used to lead a local council, as you, as you may know. Uh, the the issue here, and there's been a, and some of you sitting around, around this table will have seen successive uh, initiatives over the last 14 years from local healthcare corporates on through. I think the difference here, uh, as Karen said, this will be a consolidated budget. It will be, you know, it will be a real pool of money. It's not uh, kid-on money. There will be a statutory responsibility. Uh, and the, 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 the words uh, in this piece of enabling legislation uh, do reflect Christie principles. They do reflect the requirement for public uh, service reform. They do all, all of that. They do, they do insist on personal outcomes for people. They do insist on uh, co-productive techniques. The challenge is when you, when you move from the centre to the periphery, if I can put it that way, uh, it's not the periphery to, to those of you who serve those communities, it's, it's the centre of your communities, but they, there's, a, there's an overwhelming requirement, in my view, for a real culture change. And culture change... Ha change happens through action uh, and some of the things we are suggesting that, that for example health boards and local authorities are bridling a bit about uh, third sectors uh, um, requirements for planned sign off uh, and I know, I know that uh, MSPs will be concerned as well because there's a statutory responsibility there but where we've seen a collective sign off for change fund plans for example we, we've also seen over the last three years quite a significant change in the culture of the way officials at local level work with their partners. So it's, a, it's not as a, it's not a sign off on plans isn't a kind of power thing for the third sector. It's a mechanism to get collaboration and culture change in, in services. 
I think the other, the other, the other issue here is, as I say, I, I've referred to the supporting uh, guidelines. It really, is a, it really is important for me, uh, and I take Karen's point, you do need a bureaucratic structure, of course you do. The problem is you, in, in, with structural reorganisation, you, you get a chance, maybe a year, maybe two years, to change the way you operate. And if you seamlessly continue to do what you've been doing before, you never ever get that, that engagement. And there are, there's loads of good practice uh, right across the country in different pockets of showing, East Renfrewshire is one, for example, where inclusive working is already there, where co-productive working is there, where carers, carers uh, uh, are at the table, where disabled people are discussing their services, where they're looking at uh, uh, moving from downstream investment to upstream preventative action. And, and I guess my, my, my plea in all of this uh, is that we, we, we'll, we'll amend the bill, absolutely. I'm sure that we, you, there'll be loads of amendments here on a good piece of legislation. But the challenge will be for all of us then to make sure that the local partnerships don't uh, become uh, enmeshed in simply meeting the budget. Because if they do that, we won't get the kind of transformative change that's required. Anyone else wish to comment on it? Claire? Yeah. Um, again, like I say, we did do some consultation with carers around this. And it was interesting to see their views in general about integration, whether they thought it would improve their lives or whether it might actually have a negative impact. And they came up with both positive and negative impacts on the integration. Um, as a matter of interest, um, about 52% thought things would stay the same. 33% um, thought there would be an improvement and 14% thought things would get worse and there was a variety of reasons for that but when you look at what carers thought uh, would make it successful there were a few key points we've already mentioned engaging carers in the new structures was the number one point um, co-producing plans making sure that they had ownership of any decisions that were made and including signing off it as Ian was saying as well making sure they're around the table for that um, a very big one was ensuring resources are directed towards carer support. Um, because a lot of the, the policy integration, reshaping care for older people and so on, is looking at shifting the balance of care and shifting resources from acute to the community and having people stay at home for longer, living independently. This um, really requires um, the involvement of carers. And if you don't then provide resources towards carer support, it will have a hugely negative impact on carers' health and well-being. Um, so if you're saying more care needs to happen at home in the community, that obviously makes sense to make sure resources are directed towards that. Um, and as Ian was saying, there's some really good examples through the Change Fund. As you probably know, the Change Fund, 20% had to go towards carer support. And because of that, it acted as an excellent catalyst in terms of um, new services being developed, um, ensuring that carers were integrated into the process and developments took their needs into account. So we would like to see something similar happen in terms of integration, ensuring that carer support remains as a priority. And then the big one that a lot of carers mentioned was uh, culture change and leadership. A lot of people said this is not about processes, it'll be about individuals, whether or not it will work. Um, and it's about all the partners working together and being committed to the process and being committed, really, as I was saying, to making this engagement and co-production meaningful. So embracing um, people coming into what is maybe they see as their territory and actually being prepared to, to listen to them and involve them. Um. Yes, I just wanted to just um, come back very briefly to, um, we've been talking about third sector involvement, and it's just to highlight to the committee a, a risk that I think may be around in that I attended a, a third sector involvement session down in Melrose a few weeks back, um, very well attended, probably 60 or 70 different organisations altogether, or people from different organisations there. The feedback that came from that was that... Um, it's very difficult to integrate the third sector. It's very difficult to have them speak as one voice, and they were um, articulating this themselves. There are commercial conflicts sometimes, different principles sometimes. So uh, whilst I welcome the view that we're involving third sector in, in the process, just a risk and a watch point really to the committee to not assume that that is a single voice or a single body. You know, there are a lot of people with uh, conflicting views out there. And, not to just gloss over that point. We've all been here giving evidence as well. Pam? Um, it's 
Thank you very much, Chair. I, I was going to make a similar point, actually, um, and, and that is to say that disabled people sometimes suffer from what we call majoritism, um, which is that it's very, very difficult for seldom heard voices to, to, to make their point through something like the third sector interface. Um, by the very nature of the fact that it is attempting to, to represent a large group of local people. Um, and so one of the things that disabled people told us throughout our engagement exercises is that disabled people themselves and their directly countable organisations um, must, must have a, a key part to play in this, not just in terms of um, setting, you know, looking at the outcomes, but also in looking at how money is spent, how policies are developed. Um, and the way in which the integration um, starts from, from very, very the beginning and um, right through to monitoring and, um, and evaluation of it. And I think that one of the things that we noted was that many disabled people's organisations are operating below a critical mass. Um, so on one hand, we're saying we, we really do need to be engaged in this because disabled people are innovative just by the very fact that they have to be. When I get out of bed in the morning, I need to think of solutions <laughs> to a lot of different problems. And that's something that, that health boards, that local authorities and that, um, that our society can, could draw on. Um, but, but that needs resourced and supported, and many disabled people's organisations are struggling with that. Um, However, I think that um, we, I noted that in section 26 um, of the bill, there's a, a commitment to, to reimburse expenses of people's involvement, which I think is important. But I think that there should also be recognition there that there's something extra needed in terms of resourcing um, community-based organisations, not just the, the wider third sector, in order to be able to, to become um, accountable and to, to, to input to the plans. And we would also go, go further and suggest that um, disabled people's organisations should be should be recognised by ministers in, um, in the way that it says in the bill that ministers will recognise organisations they think are representative. But we would argue that um, DPOs um, that as directly accountable organisations um, of disabled people um, should be, be considered um, throughout the, the bill in this respect. Richard, you, you had a question on this issue. Yeah. Uh, it's basically Lord this team. Good morning and uh, nice to see you again, Pam. Uh, basically, the situation. Sorry, not, not try to single you. Um, basically, I think come back to the point that Claire Cairns made. Uh, you were saying about percentages. Uh, it was interesting reading all your submissions. But basically, I think it, the, it runs through all your submissions. Should carers have a, a guaranteed place around the table in the new integrated system uh, structure? 100% yes. In fact, you put after that eight yeses. I don't know whether that was, uh, you know. Sounds like uh, the Vicary Dibley. Um, but basically, the situation is. But again, Ian goes on. Uh, proposed health and social care partnerships will only be accountable to health boards and local authorities. There's a risk that the proposal for integration um, will represent a backward step. The third sector and people who use support services should be included within membership of integration boards. So, do you all feel that you all, you all should have a seat at the table? or involved in this bill in order to ensure that you have the point that Pam Duncan made earlier, a voice? Uh, can, can, I, I, absolutely. Uh, and just to take Karen's point, I mean, the, the third sector is, in, in Scotland uh, is massive, as a, as a collective. Uh, it's massive. Uh, it's also fair to say that uh, it's hugely misunderstood. You know, you know, you 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 all go back to your constituencies, and I'll bet you you'll find a a, a different third sector organisation every week. You know, so it's a massive it's a massive reach. However, it's not it's not unorganised. Uh, the the evidence you took from SCVO and CCPS last week, for example, uh, other strategic intermediaries as we are, will be you you'll find a significantly common thread uh, around the requirements for voice for carers, for disabled uh, people and for third sector organisations that aim to put people at the centre of services. So I don't agree with, with Karen. There's also a, a requirement emerging from the kind of chaos that sometimes happens in Scottish public life or the maelstrom of activity. Every, every local, care, uh, every local um, partnership will have a third sector interface that is tasked with uh, giving some kind of voice there. So there's a mechanism locally Na and nationally to give a, a, a more, much more unified, unified voice to the, to the third sector and to carers. Coming, coming locally, however, uh, I, I think it would, be, it would be a poor thing 
if, uh, in, uh, in 2013 if the, the, the new integrated boards, and maybe more appropriately the, the shadow boards, moving into the shadow, I think there is a, a requirement for integrated boards to take care of the business you know, quite quickly, the, 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 the transfer of staff, the, the, the structures. But moving you know, beyond Christmas and heading towards April, if you like, I think there is a requirement for, for uh, local healthcare and social care partnerships to walk the walk. And I think there should be a, a, a disabled uh, person presence and there should be a carer presence. Uh, and I think the concerns about that in, in, in statutory terms and sign-off terms is vastly overstated. I, I, it's, I, I don't rec recall many occasions uh, even in my local authority life, when we were when we were, we were divided significantly over over uh, budgets in health and social care, so so I, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it would be a huge signal to inclusiveness for health and social care partnerships to give voice. Uh, you know, one one representative of, of the care community, one representative of, of the of the disabled population and one third sector representative against maybe eight statutory sector representatives seems to me a, a reasonable thing to ask. What would be more important, Ian, in terms of, of uh, securing improvement for the, the, the outcome for individuals? That, th those individuals on those boards or the human rights focus that actually was ever present in every decision that was made or, or, or uh, you know, is it not one is against the other, or, you know... Thank you, thank you for defending me, I appreciate that. Um, I was eager to get in there. Um, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think that you need the one to, to guarantee the other. Um, I don't believe that, that the human rights principles... Um, I mean, the very nature of the human rights principles, if we take the SHRC's definition, um, the panel approach, the, the first... The, the first word is participation um, in terms of human rights principles. So you, you cannot have one without the other in, in, in that respect. Um, it would be really important to, to, to include um, the, the numbers of people who Ian, Ian's described um, as representative and as key partners in, in this um, in order to be able to deliver on the human rights aspirations. Anyone else? On that? Just on this, this, yes, this issue, yeah. can I just clarify that what you're saying is rather than have someone from the third sector interface on the board, what you want is very clearly carers, service users and service providers separated out for the third sector. So each expresses their voice individually representing the groups that they represent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's all I want. And it... <coughs> The supplement that you had, was it not? You can come back in for a question, but there are there are there are there are three people in the list. That, uh, you asked for a minute. It's not a supplementary, but um, no, uh, yeah. this will be of particular interest to, to Pam. I would think it was needs to touch on the self-directed support act. I mean, we, we've had people um, speaking to us um, wondering how it would work once the services have been integrated and when, once budgets are pooled. We've also had from from the SCBO that. Um, probably SDS is vital um, to the integration actually working. So I just wondered really what your thoughts are on whether the pro proposed, well, what effect the proposed new arrangements will have uh, on SDS. I mean, will, will they help it or hinder it or, or what? Um, we, we've asked similar questions, um, if I'm honest, um, because we're, uh, we're not 100% clear, and I'm not sure that the bill is 100% clear um, about, about how those things will work. What we've always said is that, that people should be able to apply the principles and practices of self-directed support when they exit hospital to, to access um, services in the community, and we think that that, that should continue um, throughout. Um, the other thing that, that, that we have questions around, and, and we're not sure um, how, how these will be answered, um, is around the issues of um, what, what we're integrating two systems, one that's based um, on eligibility that's free at the point of, of delivery, um, as in the NHS, and one that's based on eligibility criteria that are broadly outlined nationally and locally determined effectively. Um, and, and in actual fact, what we're seeing on, on that basis is that most local authorities um, cash strapped um, as they are, are delivering on very, very high level criteria. So it's literally life and limb provision, which we also think will have a huge impact on this, this um, issue of more care in the community. Because if there is to be more care in the community, which of course we support, then there needs to be there needs to be something that looks at that because we don't want to just unblock a bed in hospital for someone to go into the community and only have 
get up in the morning, get fed, have the bum wiped and go to bed at night. <laughs> um, you know, we want social care that is much more about that. Um, and so I think there are a, a large number of questions around, um, around how SDS will fit with this, but br more broadly, how social care will deliver into the future um, in, in terms of the, the funding probably crisis, if we're honest, um, that, that local authorities and social care is experiencing. Um, and one of the things that, we've, that we heard throughout the engagement events that we did from disabled people was that there's a large num amount of unmet need locally in terms of um, social care. And so we, we think that one of the ways to go, to go forward in trying to make SDS work really well with an integrated system, which we, we, would, we can see there's a vision that that can work, um, would be to start recording unmet needs so that we, we know what what is missing, if you like, because until we do that, I don't think we can local um, partnerships, um, as, they, as they come together, will be able to determine how much money is needed for social care or how much money is needed for health care. And so to get to that point, we, we fundamentally think we need to start looking at recording unmet need. So I understand that's a slight diversion from your original question, um, but I, I think there are a number of questions um, around how SDS will, will work. Ian, do you want to come in on this one? Uh, the Everything that Pam said, uh, 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 but also um, there's no there's no suggestion that uh, the situation, in my view, that the situation would would worsen. Uh, the question the question is how how quickly it needs to be accelerated, and that's partly about resource, but it's also partly about answering a larger question. Uh, uh, SDS is almost almost exclusively uh, focused on social care, but there is a there is a developing. Uh, argument about uh, applying SDS in health settings as well. Uh, and there's some good work in, uh, been done in Scotland, and my organisation has, a, has a, a, an officer looking at uh, self-directed support in health settings as well. But it's, um, the, challenge, uh, the challenge is to take uh, the... I nearly said the, the fell hand of accountants of health budgets. I don't, I don't mean it quite like that, but you know, health budgets are locked in a particular paradigm at the minute. But you know, come, come, come the day, come the hour, you're going to get maybe a third of a health board's budget located into uh, uh, health and social care partnerships. So there will be the opportunity in that setting to be looking at SDS in a different way. And it kind of harks back to my original point, Chair. Health and social care partnerships and the statutory agencies need to look at, need to look, in my view, need to look at this as an opportunity to refresh and, and reform the way they think about things. Uh, you know, to, they're locked into uh, they're locked into crisis management of budgets. They're locked into to, to, to timetables for delivery. They need a bit of space to be doing some fresh thinking about what policy means and what practice means in the in the 21st century. And that's if if they don't get that, we'll, we'll, we'll not we'll not see an acceleration in SDS for social care. We'll not see a, a, any innovative approaches to SDS in health settings. And, and, and that, would be my, that would be, again, my plea to the new health and social care partnerships, that you need to be applying a fresh prism uh, on the way you look at uh, health and social care services. I, I, think, I think both those responses have been actually very helpful. I, mean, I think ever since care in the community came in, it's always been a recognition it's not a cheap option. And, and you know, to, to work properly, it, it does uh, in, involve resource. Um, and, and I think um, Ian's point about um, you know, basically change in culture, change in the, the way of looking at things, I, th I see as perhaps the only way this, this really is going to work. So just to have that on the record, I find very helpful. Thanks very much. Malcolm. Well, thanks very much. I mean, I think it's probably moved on since I first asked uh, to come in because I was, I was interested in this whole area of, you know, the mechanisms of embodying the principles. I mean, I think I certainly completely agree with you about co-production and the principles, so that's one thing to put in the bill, but I was interested in the mechanisms for ensuring that happened. So uh, Ian Welsh's comments about, you know, who should be on the board was helpful, but I suppose I'm worrying, wondering also about the other mechanisms that currently exist. One of those, for example, that we've not asked about is the public partnership forum. And I'm wondering whether you see, you know, it's like you want the principles, people on the board, and that's fine. Uh, but will these mechanisms still exist as well? Presumably the third sector interfaces will still exist. But I mean, just specifically on public partnership forums, is that a, a useful mechanism still? I know it was being commended in two of the submissions, so I just wonder how all that will fit together. Or is, is, it, is it just, do we just really need a multiplicity of uh, forums and mechanisms to make sure this happens? 
Carmen? Well, I think um, PPFs at the moment are a bit at sea. They aren't sure where they fit in. There, are, uh, there is some confusion about where they fit. There's also an issue around um, how representative they are. Um, they tend to consist of people with a vested interest, so you might argue that their, their views are skewed. So how public you know, the forum uh, rep views are is, is um, confusing. But certainly from the PPF that I represent, um, they really don't know at the moment and they don't have any guidance or any information that they can uh, identify from the legislation as, it, as it's uh, drafted at the moment of where they will fit in in the new um, care partnership. So I guess we're here really looking for some answers and suggestions of how that might uh, be achieved. Um, there are subgroups of the PPFs as well in terms of patient reference groups and various other subgroups that exist. Um, we're also concerned that we don't have a reasonable um, representation from the carer population. We don't particularly have a good representation from young people. So I think there's an opportunity to, to look again at how PPFs might be formulated and just what their role might be in the new, new partnership set up. Claire, then Ian. Uh, we undertook a project in the pilot um, area of um, the Highlands looking at when they were moving towards integration and how care engagement and the structures for engagement worked um, in that area. And what we find, and I think this is typical of most areas, is it can quite often be quite a confusing and cluttered environment. I mean, as well as public partnership forums, there are very often um, quite a lot of specialist forums or groups that meet, um, and it's quite often difficult to discern where the decisions are made, where that information is going, where the flow is, and whether um, discussions around particular subjects actually make it to uh, meetings where you know, the decisions are made around budgets and around um, service development. Um, and so what I would say is, is you know, whatever the, the new structures are, as long as they are meaningful, um, as long as they, um, what you're not doing is you're not asking too many carers to be involved in too many groups. Um, what carers want is they want to be involved in the, the groups that are meaningful and are going to make the decisions and they want to be listened to. They want to be resourced so that um, whenever they're attending meetings, they've also been able to go and attend their carer forum or um, their carer groups so that they can um, take that reference body of carers and bring that information um, forward. Um, so I would say those are the lessons from the Highlands. Um, what they were doing was they've kept quite a lot of their structures and they've added new ones in on top of it. And it puts quite a lot of strain on people then in terms of involvement. Um, because then actually people do want to be involved in the decision-making process, but like I say, they want to make sure that um, their time is being well used. Yeah. Um, th th this is... Uh um, you know, we, we, we talk about moving to structures, but, you know, this is a messy world. And, and I think just in terms of the archaeology of how this was set up, the Scottish Health Council were, were, cha were tasked with setting up uh, public partnership forums for the health service. Uh, they've done that diligently. They, they, they also have a, a res they also have a, a responsibility uh, not only for setting that up, but also for monitoring how well health boards deliver that. So, in that context, although Karen, uh, Karen has said that all, that all the things about representation that are proper, nonetheless, there is still an active participation network within the NHS that you know, relatively well serves a purpose uh, and, and in some areas is, is excellent. Other areas it's maybe, maybe less excellent. But, you know, going into a new structure uh, where, where a, a, another, another tranche of services is coming into to the fore, where there is a different, uh, a different in, uh, involvement or participation network is, go, is going to be a challenge. Uh, but I, uh, to answer your question, uh, Malcolm, I think what will happen practically is that the existing, the existing structures will be mapped onto the new partnerships for a while. And, you know, and, you know, something will emerge. I know the Scottish Health Council are looking for, for a, you know, to try and design or, 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 or have designed a, 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 an inclusive new model uh, here. But I, I think, in the first instance, the, the public partnership uh, forums will be mapped onto the, the new health and social care partnerships. But it, but it goes back to my first point. There will be a requirement on the new health boards to look at engagement. 
and there are, and there are engagement uh, guidelines. Uh, you know, Pam's referred to uh, referred to them. There are national standards for community engagement, which the Scottish Council for Development uh, uh, for Community Development have have uh, have applied, which are applicable here. But it's it's not it's not a tidy world, uh, and it will require work over the next year and a half to be building new ways of participation. So, you know, I, 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 it just goes back to the point I, I was making earlier. There's a real uh, focus in the first two years of, of trying to build something uh, new uh, and much more inclusive. Um, can I... Pam, um, do you want to... Just, just briefly, um, following from that, in the same way that we wouldn't um, ask a, a, a men's organisation to, to represent women, um, we, we believe that it's fundamentally important that disabled people's organisations are able to represent disabled people. Um, and on that basis, um, we, we think that it would be really important for them and their, the, the ability of them to engage with the, the structures you've described, or indeed the third sector interface, um, needs to be needs to be strengthened because it's very difficult um, in, in times um, like this for organisations to, to grow their capacity to do that. Um, but we believe that taking a social model approach to health and social care as they do, um, disabled people's organisations will be able to offer a broad view of, of the, the, the reality that health and social care can bring to people's lives, the, the, the difference it can make to, to people's participation, the, the, the the crucial aspect that it, or the crucial role that it plays in terms of their human rights and, and um, their equality in society. And taking that broad view, I think, is really important, particularly when we're looking at preventative agenda, when it's not only about treating conditions or, or providing care and support, but it's actually about um, enabling disabled people um, and, and other service users in, in health and social care to, to lead an ordinary life and to, to, to play their full part in the community. And I think DPOs have a really unique um, lens through which to, to, to provide... Um, key and valuable information and, and engagement on that basis. Thanks, that's very helpful. If I could ask one more question, which I think goes to the heart of the matter in a slightly different way. Uh, Ian Welsh said um, one third of the health board budget would go into the health and social care arrangements, integration arrangements. But he also said earlier on there was a significantly common thread with the organisations that we heard from last week. And I don't know if you followed last week, but I think at least two out of the three on the panel you're referring to were very concerned that there would be minimal amounts of money going in from health but possibly from local government as well and uh, suggested there should be more national direction on that I think in fact at least one of them if not two of them suggested that budget should be set nationally for the for the body so I, I wonder what you think of that suggestion but if you don't support that suggestion how I mean, how, how can you ensure that if, if a third is the appropriate sum of money or, I mean, some people are concerned that very little will go in from, from the acute sector in health, for example. I, think that's a, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't always agree with uh, SEV or CCPS, uh, you know, and, and sometimes in part that's because I'm still involved locally. Uh, uh, but um, and, uh, it will be variable. But there, there, there is a tension around central direction, and MSPs will be as aware, more aware of that than all of us. There is a tension between central direction and local control. Uh, and uh, I mean, my view is that health and social care budgets should be decided locally. Uh, I'm a former elect elected member, but perhaps I would say that. Uh, there is also another tension around the extent to which you allocate acute care money into the, 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 into the, the budgets. And, and there'll be a variable approach to that uh, uh, also across the board. But, they, but you know, to put that in a context, Malcolm, this piece of legislation is an enabling piece of legislation. In my, in my view, it's a, it's a partnership. It's a piece of partnership legislation. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, the, depending on how good and trusting your local partnerships are, uh, will, will, de will depend on, on what, what budgets go in. But already there are variable, uh, I, I know that there are variable approaches. Within Ayrshire, for example, at least one of the local authorities are putting the, some of the children's services in. 
others are not. So you're going to have variable approaches. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with my, my colleagues that uh, it's all just about uh, packing additional resources in. It's about, uh, it's about maximising the, the best outcomes for the local population. And, you know, Pam said something about, you know, earlier about unmet uh, need. Um, so sometimes in the, in the, lo in the localities, uh, you know, there's, there's been scant regard to, to, to trying to match population need, and that, and that to me, is a, a very important part of the process uh, here. My, my, my son's disabled, uh, and I'm a carer myself. Uh, you, you know, to be honest with you, my interaction with both health, the health and social care systems is minimal. You know, uh, you know, I, you know my, my son kind of strolls through, he's 30 years old, strolls through without without uh, making an impact or getting, uh, you know, any significant support, uh, 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 you know, in any shape or form. So I, I, I do think it's a local response to circumstance. But there, 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 is, another, there is another dimension to this as well. Um, it's not all about resources, but it is about partnership. And we haven't, we haven't even talked about, for example, uh, the issue of locality planning, the issues of, of GPs, GP, uh, GPs and, 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 and how they face the communities. I see John Gillis behind me. Uh, you know, there, there's fantastic work uh, uh, been done in localities around linking the community to GP practices in, 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 in a much more significant way. And, and I think that needs to be part of the landscape here. So it ain't all about money, it, it would, be, would be my view. It is all about how you, how you work in partnership locally. Um, and then Claire, I think, do you want them? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I agree um, that, that it is about using, using resources differently as well as, as about um, also looking at how, how we address some of the unmet needs and that might be about looking at new resources or it might be just solely about looking at how we use it differently. But um, as, as Ian says, there will be variability in terms of how how local um, partnerships take uh, approach this issue, which is why, again, I would go back to my earlier point about portability and the principle of portability being on the bill, because whilst variability and local decision-making is important, and I couldn't possibly sit here today and advocate that disabled people need to be involved um, as, as deeply as I have without recognising that local that decisions need to be made at a community level. However, that should never come face to face with the human rights of someone. So, for example, it makes it almost impossible to move from one area to another, um, or, or in some cases, um, as this could end up being, from one street to another. <laughs> um, and so that's why I think, again, I would make the point uh, strongly that something should be um, included in the bill about portability so that it, it, the end user themselves doesn't experience any um, significant disadvantage when they when they move when they move around if they choose to do so for education employment or just just because they fancy a different area um, but so i think it would be really important to put that in into the bill um, particularly on the basis of what ian's described yeah. i think when we're looking at this issue it's quite useful to look at reshaping care for older people because obviously it's a front runner in terms of integration and some of the lessons that we can learn through the change fund and then the move towards joint strategic commissioning mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with the change fund, um, in some ways, decisions were a bit easier because it was additional money. Um, it was all about kind of um, looking at pilots which could start to deliver some of the principles behind integration and early preventative services. When you start to look at joint strategic commissioning, we're asking people to be incredibly brave because we're asking them to say, um, looking at money in a different way and start to look at where you disinvest in services. And I think that's what currently um, partnerships really struggle with. Um, we, I was involved uh, with the joint improvement team in a review of joint strategic commissioning plans in relation to carers to see where they fitted in them. And I think across the board, there was, they could have been braver in terms of disinvestment. There was very little mention of it. There was very little people putting forward solutions in terms of shifting the money from acute into the community. And I think this is where areas are really going to struggle. And so it's then the decision on how directive you are in terms of that and whether you decide how much money needs to go into the pot or whether you let decisions be made locally. But I would say looking at reshaping care for older people, um, there definitely uh, there needs to be an encouragement for partnerships to be brave. Um, but also I think it's very difficult for them because they're also looking at um, decisions that have to go through uh, local authority decision making processes that are accountable to councillors and so on. And I think these are things that kind of quite often hold back on these brave decisions. Yes, thank you, Chair. Part of what I was going to say was about the different structures and about the, the accountability processes. But just to go back to the 
briefly to the where PPFs come or go, and um, Ian mentioned about the fact that they would be sort of mapped into the new system, certainly for a couple of years or so. It's just a watch point that we don't lose that golden opportunity to, to improve them, make changes, um, make them more effective, broader, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we don't do it in the early days, then there's a danger that it just gets lost and kind of withers on the vine. There's been quite a lot of requirement. I was reading in some of the papers about guidelines, um, which is sort of missing at the moment, and, and overarching principles. And I guess a lot of the things we've talked about about today <coughs> could certainly be fed into overall guidelines and overall principles and it would just be a, a plea really not to forget that as a, as a principle on terms of, of public representation um, on oh, the new bill. That's okay. You okay? Mm -hmm. Mark McDonald. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, <coughs> I note the, the comments regarding <coughs> sorry, who should be around the uh, the table and it, it strikes me that the more people who come to the committee and say they want a seat around the table the more I think we're going to need pretty big tables for some of these integration boards but I take on board the points that are being raised at the last meeting when we were uh, talking to the representatives of the third sector they were quite clear that they saw their role as being as part of the strategic planning side of things and then stepping taking a step back when it came to the commissioning of services I wonder where you would see the organisations that you would see as relevant to, to your interest fitting into their role within, uh, if, if it were the case that, that a seat round the table were to be afforded to them, um, where you would see that fitting in, in terms of the strategic planning, the commissioning, both, how you, how you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that would, that would be Annie Gunn and Logan's position, that they would, the CCPS, for example, would simply be involved in strate the strategic dimensions and the, uh, their members would then step back. I, th I think the whole, I mean, there's a, there's a, a significant uh, uh, piece of work uh, going, going on uh, in the, uh, a committee called the Joint Strategic Commissioning Committee, which, which I'm sure, I'm sure the, the, the the evidence from that and the work from that will be fed into the, the guidelines. Uh, but beyond that, there is a, there is a, the tension there is between a, a definition of commissioning and the definition of procurement. Uh, and and for, for, for those of us who've been around quite a while, you know, the, the move probably, I, I, can't, I don't remember when the date would be, but, you know, maybe in, you know, the late 90s or the early 90s, uh, the move to compulsory competitive tendering uh, then led to a, 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 a public procurement uh, regime. Uh, and what, what, what has happened, certainly, in, what happened then, certainly in social care, uh, is that uh, much of the social value of, of uh, procuring a service uh, uh, lost out to. Uh, to, uh, to, to cost, uh, and you know, I, 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 I'm not going to speak for, for Pam, I'll speak for myself, uh, certainly that you, you, you ended up with the obscenity of uh, e-auctions for, for uh, domiciliary care, for example, uh, and, uh, and local authorities were hidebound by that, that, uh, that regime, if you like. Uh, now, a, a much more sympathetic response to commissioning would be... Um, designing a service with service users, uh, with, with organisations that have, a, have a, a private sector and third sector organisations that have a developed expertise in the, in the, in the work uh, against a, a background of a, 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 what the public uh, health requirements are for, for our locality. So I think there's a, a much more nuanced approach uh, com coming for us here. But again, when, if, you go to, if you go back to the local authority or the health boards, what you, what you, what you have in, in, in significant measure now is people who procure services and, and pe not people who commission services. So uh, there is a cultural issue there about uh, reshaping culture and values around how you, how you uh, design services. And that will involve uh, or bringing organisations in uh, rather than having them compete across a, across a table, uh, in my view. Okay. I mean, I'm interested in maybe if there are other views before I ask the sort of follow-up that comes from that. Um. Yes, Pam. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
First of all, I think um, one of the things we need to be clear about is that it, it's not so much just about saying, you know, we, we would quite like to have a seat around the table too. It's, it's, it's about understanding the value of, of listening and engaging with different people in order to be able to get this right. And I think that's why it's really, really important. And that's probably why you're hearing everybody saying they want to be there. Um, and part of that is also going to be about a nervousness that who's representing me at that table, who's actually going to put my views across. And I think if we can get it right, uh, so it's not so much about the size of the table, I would say, it's about how representative that table is. And if we can get the representation on that table right, and we can convince local people, um, and I mean communities as well as communities of interest, so disabled people, um, LGBT, etc., etc. If we can convince them that the mechanisms are, um, for engagement through to that table are strong, then it's really then then I, I, I think it's less about the size of the table and more about the how we resource the representation um, around it. I would say. Um, you wish to come in? Yes, I just wanted to come back. There's a third. I think there's a third element to planning commission. I think that's scrutiny, and I think that's what we're talking about. The fact that the people around the table don't need to be the planners, they don't need to be the commissioners necessarily, but they certainly need to be the scrutineers to make sure that they, you know, the the services are being delivered effectively and, and the best economy and so on and so forth. So I think it's important that we recognise that role of scrutiny as well around the table. I mean, I, I come from a, a similar perspective as Ian in this, and I'm a parent carer as well, and so I, I understand the interactions that take place. But um, I guess there are two, two follow-on questions to that. The first is, is um, does the role that you envisage necessarily require a seat at the table? Is there another way that the, the function that you seek can be carried out without needing to have something on the face of the bill? I know there was, there was reference to perhaps having something enshrined within the guidance and the regulations. And the second point is, how would you ensure that it were, as you put it, the right organisation? Because I can think even within my, in my own constituency, there are a range of organisations often providing very similar services, but in a different locality from each other. How do you ensure that you have the right voice at the table and ensure that people don't feel that they've maybe been unnecessarily excluded? So those are sort of maybe two questions that, that would throw out to the panel. To pick that up. I'll pick up one part of it. I mean, certainly in the third sector context, uh, there, is a, there is a third sector interface in every health and social care partnership. And I would be arguing that, that uh, who, are who are charged in part with, uh, for example, signing off the change fund. Uh, and uh, I, that, for me, would be the logical third, third sector representative. The, the, there's, a, there's a secondary issue, uh, which I, I, I think uh, is implicit in your question, Mark, about the about the cluster of organisations that are out there, uh, I, I think there's a, and I'm just speaking here uh, um, practically. I think my view is that every health and social care partnership should have uh, should fund an engagement officer that sits within the, the third sector interface, who who are t who is ta that who, who that person tasked with working with the, the officers of the partnership to ensure that there's coherent uh, and consistent representation uh, through the, the various working groups that will be set up to look at services. Now that would be, you know, just to put that in a context, that would be 50 grand, say, cost of salary and on costs against a, a potential budget uh, in a health and social care partnership of, of about 150 million. So, so just, just to try and get coherent and consistent activity. But Pam and Claire will have another view on the, the carers. Um, and um, our, our members um, consistently at all of the consultation events that we did said that, they, that yes, they do feel that they need to be around the table. Um, and part of that, I think, is about a historical... Um, the historical oppression that disabled people have faced in society and a fear that in actual that in actual fact unless people are around the table i'm going to use a quote that i've heard recently if you're not around the table you're on the menu <laughs> which sounds quite controversial and antagonistic and i don't mean it to um but i do think it's it's really really important um that disabled people who are are using these services on a day-to-day -day basis can bring the unmitigated voice of that experience to that table and that's why i would advocate really strongly um, for the role of disabled people's organisations around the table as they're directly accountable um, to, to their members um, locally. Uh, they, again, they can bring that unmitigated voice of experience to the table. Um, by the very nature of the fact they're disabled people, they 
they have to navigate um, society's barriers and problems in a way that, that um, effectively find solutions on a daily basis. Um, and those are things that, not just for the sake of ticking a box and saying we're including disabled people, but those are things that health and social care partnerships should want to bring on board and should, and should embrace um, so that they can do exactly <laughs> what the policy memorandum in, um, in, the, in, in the bill suggests um, in terms of uh, the experience of, of the end user of health and social care integration. Interested Claire? just on, my, on the second point Claire? that I raised. Um, if I could Claire, did you wish to Yes. Um, um, similar to Pam, yes, we referred already to the focus groups and consultation we did with carers, and you'll know already then that 100% of carers felt they should have a guaranteed place around the table. And I think you mentioned as well why there were so many yeses. <laughs> we did uh, message boards with carers, and those were direct quotes, so one person did write eight yeses. Um, just to clarify that. But in, particularly with carers, um, one of the negative, potential negative impacts they saw about integration was that they would actually um, lose some of what they've already gained in terms of having a place around the table because you, you may know that in 2011 uh, carers were given a guaranteed place around the table when it came to community health partnerships. So if this doesn't happen when we move towards integration they will see that as being a massive step backwards. Um, and in terms of your point about how do you get the right person around the table, I mean that is a Certainly a good point, and I've already mentioned with carers, carers cover so many different age groups and so many different um, conditions and so on. It is quite difficult to get one person to represent that, but in terms of supporting it, there is already a very strong network of local care organisations, and I see them very, being very much the experts in this. So it wouldn't be too difficult for partnerships to go to their local care organisation and devolve that function to them, and it's something they would do very well, provided they're resourced to do it. I think that, that deals certainly with the second point raised. Uh, Final question then, um, we had rep um, evidence from COSLA um, around the, the scope of the bill and the potential for widening the scope of the bill in future. Um, obviously there, there is talk that they want to see it very much narrowed to deal with adult services only and that, that would then require further legislation if we wanted to, for example, roll it out to children's services. Uh, in the future. Now, obviously, most of your organisations will, will not just simply deal with adults, um, but will deal with a range of, of individuals who come into contact with, with social care and health services. I wonder what your view is on, in terms of the ability for ministers to widen the scope of the bill, should this prove successful. Um, the, the view I took was that, that if, you, if you simply say, if you want to widen it to children's services, you can do that locally, but we won't have a, a sort of a wider rollout. We would end up in the situation which we've been in before this bill uh, came into being, where we have a couple of areas which serve as sort of pioneers and get cracking on, and then other areas which this legislation is absolutely necessary in order to get the change that, that we want to see. So I'd be interested in your view on, on the white for future widening of the bill. <laughs> Uh, this is this is we we as an organisation wouldn't, wouldn't have taken a, a particular view on this. Uh, personally, um, uh, I, I wouldn't support Cosla uh, on this. That wouldn't be a surprise to Cosla. Uh, I, I, I think you'll uh, when the, the 32 health and social care partnerships shape up. Uh, you'll get an interesting mix of, uh, not all of them will simply opt to have older people's services. Mm -hmm. There will be an interesting mix uh, and there, w there, will be, uh, there will be other, other services in, the, uh, in their uh, community health teams and mental health teams. There will be a, 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 a full panoply of services there. And uh, the, the, the notion that we would come back uh, to this uh, uh, in the near future, to, to, to do some more legislations, uh, you know, would be mind blowing uh, for, for, for us. We are much more interested in, in seeing the health and social care partnerships as a conduit for change locally, uh, and there is a big, there's a very significant agenda for, for, for change uh, to be to be delivered. That the, the legislative context for this. A, a proposal allows, and I think that's plenty enough to be going on. And, and, and just to say, Chair, uh, I mean, some, somebody, just, sorry to just inter, uh, interject on this one, somebody talked, uh, Claire talked about the change fund uh, uh, been, been a, 
been new money. Health boards would, would say it wasn't, wasn't new money, it, it was their money, you know, in effect, but it, it was money directed to the, to the point of change. And I, I, would, I would just say, I mean, my, my, my understanding is that there will be a, a sim post the end of the change fund, there will be a, a similar potentially enhanced amount of money that will be utilisable for uh, health and social care innovation. Uh, and, uh, and I would commend that, and, 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 and that would also, for health and social care partnerships, would also be one of those opportunities to be doing things differently. You don't need a lot of money, uh, discretionary money, to be doing things differently locally. You do need some money. Uh, and, and so that would be, that would be to, to tie it into your question, Mark, that would also be an opportunity to, to test, in my view, new approaches and, and new client groups uh, within health and social care partnerships. But I, I, but I, I disagree with COSLA in relation to that. Carden? Yes, I was just going to say that I think we, we have to allow for um, the legislation to cover all age groups, not least because of the point of transition um, from younger people, certainly for younger people with disabilities moving through services. It's already complicated enough. I think if you were having to transfer from one sort of structure to another, it would become even, even more so. So I think that's um, uh, absolutely critical. And I think that... Uh, the local authorities and the, and, the, and the health boards need to be able to, to make those decisions themselves. I, I know some already have. I believe Highland have already gone down that route with the lead agency model. So, I mean, we're already there in some ways. So I think we need to stick with that. Anyone else want to respond to that? No? OK. Mark? Thanks, Mark. Aileen? Uh, thanks, uh, convener. And I just uh, wanted to pick up on um, some of the points that uh, Ian Welsh had made around um, the locality planning. And it came from a, an, an issue that arose at last week's evidence session that we took from a number of organisations, including uh, SCVO, um, where we discussed about the capacity uh, implications um, for third and independent sectors in terms of the fact that the operating environment remains quite... Um, challenging so really to kind of you know ask about the fact the key challenge is how do we build you know the capacities in the communities when we're seeing more of the acute care coming back into our communities and obviously there's a role a key role to be played there from um, our um, our GPs they're very much central to much of the integration rollout and I'm conscious that we'll be taking evidence from um, Dr John Gillies in the next uh, session from the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners. Results just to say, I mean, how best do you think that we can build that capacity within the communities? I mean, obviously, we saw there was proposals that came from um, the Deep End uh, back in March, and they talked about using um, health hubs um, built around GP services to involve, um, integrate and innovate on progressive health and social care initiatives and approaches to the health and social care partnerships. It's a, that's a great question, Aileen. <laughs> uh, uh, the, 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 maybe to start at the end, uh, 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 um, um, ourselves and RCGP, for my organisation and RCGP are currently, and Joinal, I'm sure I'll say more about this, are currently working on a, 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 a good project called the Lynx Project, which is about uh, working with uh, G, GPs uh, uh, to, to build a uh, greater cohesion and information in, in localities. And uh, we're, we're about to, my organisation is about to work with the Deep End on a, a related uh, project, Scottish Government uh, funded project, which will uh, try and establish the efficacy of link workers in deprived areas working around a, 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 deep, a deep end or a series of deep end practices. The object being to, in the long term, to uh, prevent uh, people from requiring uh, uh, medical services, and, and and I believe that's a I believe that's a practical model that would be that uh, you know if, if the evidence shapes up after a couple of years is implementable in all deep end practice areas, um, but. The wider question of uh, building capacity is, is challenging. Uh, um, so, um, so there is already a, a, a programme uh, of uh, building capacity through the Joint Improvement Team. Uh, I don't know why you're taking evidence from the Joint Improvement Team, but uh, that's, a, again, a Scottish Government vehicle that's delivering fantastic work 
uh, in localities, uh, building a capacity around co-production. Uh, they've got a very good uh, toolkit for co-production, but building up an improvement network um, uh, in, in the third sector interfaces. But that's a, that's a, so that's a skilling up exercise, effectively. The third sector interfaces themselves, which are which are change fund, have a change fund sign-off function, uh, in my view, require a bit of additional investment, uh, 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 a bit of additional human resource, really, to be allowing them to be stepping up to the plate. There is a, there is then a uh, there is then a, a, a national resource, and as you'll know, Aileen, we we, we host uh, a change fund support team, the, the alliance does, and. And, and we, we, we will be getting a wee bit of additional resource to turn that team into a health and social care support team. Uh, it's, governed by a, a, it's governed by the third sector and Scottish Government Joint Improvement Team are involved. And they will be helping to build, uh, skill up the third sector interfaces as well. So, you know, the, 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 so there's a bit of national support, there's a, a bit more support needed with the third sector interfaces, certainly. But... Yeah, around that is a larger question uh, about how DPOs and carer, carer organisations are, are, are uh, resourced up to deal with this. Claire, Claire has, represents a whole coalition of carers, but she's one person. Uh, you know, so she's not going to be at every health and social care uh, partnership. So there is a requirement there. Now, that's, that's uh, uh, realisable. It's quantifiable and realisable. Uh, but uh, and in the, and if, I, if I was speaking from a from a sectarian interest point of view, it's a it's a it's a, a hugely infinitesimal amount of money compared to 12 billion that sits in the statutory sector on the health board sides. Now I don't have I don't have the political uh, capital to, uh, or authority to be able to to to. to cull off some resource there. But I would suggest that's the kind of practical stuff that needs to be, to be, to be applied. And there is, some, there is some scope within the financial memorandum to the bill to build a bit of, a bit of support there. Uh, and, and, and for example, uh, we'll, we'll be, the Alliance will be built, starting to build a small, a, a small, we hope, influential initiative called the Health and Social Care Academy. Uh, and other uh, and SEVO will be doing some Pathfinder proposals uh, around this, working with Voluntary Action Scotland. But we could do with more money uh, in the interfaces, in my view, to tool them up to be prepared for uh, health and social integration locally. Claire. Um, I'm going to go back again to the, cha the change fund for some good examples of how this is working already. So in a few areas in Scotland, um, the change fund has funded the development of care forums and the training and support of care representatives. And I think that's something which has been very successful in terms of improving care engagement, but also, as I've been saying, making it more meaningful and making it for carers themselves, the fact they feel supported, they feel they're being listened to, it makes it a lot more valuable experience for them as well and ensuring they're connected to other carers in the local area. So that something that could easily be replicated across Scotland. Um, there's also some really good examples through the Change Fund of um, increasing the capacity of care organisations to provide support to carers. Um, because over the years, obviously, the more, there are more carers, there are more um, older people, and there are more people coming forward needing support. And it's been an issue for, for quite a long time. So there has been funding going into some areas to, for example, um, in Stirling. They now have two hospital discharge workers who are based within a hospital setting. Um, and they're able to identify carers at a very early stage and help with that transition back into the home, making sure that the carers' needs are considered alongside the person that they care for. And they have some good evidence that because it's such a good example of joint working, um, they've demonstrated these interventions help to avoid crises for carers in the future and future readmission to hospital. Another example would be in West Lothian, where they have... Um, an older uh, carer's worker who works very closely with the local reablement team within the local authority. So that whenever somebody is getting a reablement package, the carer is trained alongside that. Because um, I think reablement um, is excellent, and I'm sure you'll know some of the results that it's produced in terms of being able to um, get people to regain their independence. But if you don't train and you don't support the carer alongside <coughs> that, it's very easy for people to go back to the old ways of uh, have people having things done for them. Um, so I think those are the kind of things which um, 
like I say, both increase the capacity of carers to engage, but also increase the capacity of local care organisations to provide the support that's needed to help to assist um, integration. Okay, thanks very much. That's been very useful for us. Thank, thanks very much. I think there's only uh, there was a couple of things and uh, that maybe we haven't uh, covered, which was we can do it briefly as the, um, the charging that uh, you know the cost creep issue that that, that that has come up in a bit of uh, uh, concern. And we know how from previous evidence how important that can be. And if I can roll that up um, in terms of. Uh, broader outcomes and the, the inspection and complaints procedures that, that might, you know, how people can exercise some of those rights that we we spoke about earlier. We brief responses for that for the record. We have, of course, got written evidence from you as well. Pam? Um, firstly, um, it will come as no surprise, because I think I've said this to this committee in the past, that disabled people and their organisations believe that to, to charge people for a service such as community care, um, a service that is so crucial to their independence and their human rights, um, is, is unfair um, and, and unparalleled. <laughs> we, don't, we don't charge um, anyone else um, for, for the privilege of enjoying their human rights in the same sense. Um, and so we, we have submitted um, to, to the, the committee um, that, we, that we believe that this issue needs to be addressed um, with this bill, particularly not least because of the unfairness of doing it, but also because um, of the, the bureaucracy and the difficulties around how are we actually going to tell which part of that budget is chargeable and which part of it isn't. Um, none of us, I'm sure, want, um, cost, uh, want people to start charging for services um, that they would have ordinarily got from the NHS for free. Um, and equally, we don't want um, necessarily people to continue to have to pay for social care when it's without it, they couldn't possibly participate in society. Um, we've done some work um, around this. Um, and we, we, we believe that the approximate cost is something in the region of about £50 million pounds across Scotland, um, which is what is collected in charging for social care, which in the grand scheme of things is um, not a huge amount of money, um, but it can represent up to 100% of a disabled person's income. Um, and so when you look at it from that point of view, when many of the people who are paying these charges are living in poverty, um, it, it seems so unfair um, and, and something that I, I believe we, we really do need to address as a society. Um, the, the issue of complaints and reviews, um, we, we were surprised to see that the bill was quite silent on, um, on complaints processes, particularly given that um, there, there is a different process for health complaints um, and social care complaints. And we note that the duties um, in the bill will follow the delegated function. And so we could have a situation where a health board is delegating a function to a, social, um, a local authority. And so what, where would you complain? Which process would you use? Um, and so we, we accept the, the Public Services Ombudsman's um, recommendations to align the process as closely as possible. However, we would go slightly further than that, um, which may not surprise you, um, and suggest that there probably needs to be an independent mechanism for people to be able to make complaints. Um, and we raise some concerns about um, the, the complexity of the system and how, for example, and this is not a, a slight on the, the Ombudsman in any way, but the, the issues are so um, detailed that to be able to deal with that at a national level um, in, in, the, in de the, the right level of depth that is required um, would be extremely difficult. Um, and so we would, we would recommend that there is um, locally independent mechanisms, perhaps in the form of a tribunal. Anyone else? It's very comprehensive on, on costs. I thought it was quite comprehensive, <laughs> comprehensive myself. I, I, maybe, I could, maybe I could just say, uh, say a bit about uh, the, uh, the outcomes. Uh, the, I mean, just, just to say, uh, again, that there's been quite a comprehensive... I have to, again, uh, you know, congratulate the CABSEC and his, his, his team. Uh, um, there's been a very comprehensive, uh, consultative process and inclusive process around this. And there, is a, there, there, is a, there has been a working group on outcomes and I'm pleased to see outcomes enshrined there. There's a kind of larger issue about outcomes there that, uh, that, uh, that is important, though, uh, and, and that's you know that's the, a shift towards trying to focus on uh, personal outcomes for individuals. Uh, and uh, I, again, that's part of the culture change that goes on. My son, my son uh, is quite different from from uh, another another uh, uh, young man who has uh, cerebral palsy and he's quite different from another young man who has down syndrome you know so personal outcomes is is really really important uh, and and I, I, and I, and uh, 
uh, I'll be happy to furnish the. Come out. We've got a series of uh, reports coming out uh, uh, called "We've Got to Talk About Outcomes," which I think will be informative for the committee. Um, and, and just finally, for my, for, just to say, you know, uh, um, Pam, ha Pam has been talking about human rights. We've got a, a document here again, which we, we'll uh, uh, maybe give some uh, 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 some larger background to the committee uh, called "Being Human," which is, describes the rights-based approach to health and social care integration uh, as well. Thanks, Ian. We look forward to the additional information. Um, uh, we have had uh, your written evidence and we appreciate your oral evidence here today. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, suspend the committee at this point where we set up for the round table. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
We'll resume the evidence session um, with our round table. And this is the fun part, a uh, round table. We all get to introduce ourselves. My name is Duncan McNeill. Um, I'm the MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde and the Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm John Gillis. I'm a, the Chairman of the Royal College of GPs in Scotland and I've been a GP for many years. Uh, Bob Doris, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Committee. I'm Rachel Cackett. I'm a policy advisor with the Royal College of Nursing for Scotland. Richard Lyle, Central Region. Ruth Stark from the Scottish Association for Social Work. Uh, Gil Patterson representing Claybank and Mogai. Uh, Gabby Stewart representing the Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. Uh, Aileen MacLeod, uh, MSP for the South of Scotland. I'm Dave Watson. I'm the Head of Bargaining Campaigns at Unison Scotland. I'm Christy McCarthy and I'm a consultant geriatrician in Glasgow and I'm here for the British Geriatric Society. Lynette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. John Taylor, Vice Chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland. Uh, Mark MacDonald, MSP for Aberdeen Donside. Thank you all for that. Um, and I think Bob's going to kick us off, but I will do my best to get all of our panellists in here today and the MSPs know that the the panellist contribution will be taken uh, a, a you know, priority to, to the politicians. So we're going to try and listen. Bob? Yeah, not something politicians are always uh, good at doing is, is listening. I will try to keep my, my question as brief as possible, but the, the roundtable introduction probably is a good starting point for my question because it's about stakeholder involvement and which stakeholders, of which all of you are stakeholders, um, should be specified on the face of any bill. Um, I think we could have had to have built a new committee table if we were to get all the stakeholders that would wish to have a formal input into health and social care integration, make it larger to get everyone involved. So it's how we, we make sure all the relevant stakeholders have an input into health and social care integration. To what degree does that have to be specified on the face of the bill. I'm minded as soon as you start specifying some of that on the face of the bill, if an organisation is not represented, you then get a two-tier system and stakeholders. There's a nervousness around that. And uh, also how unwieldy it could potentially be, depending on how we uh, take forward strategically. So not just for your own organisation, but what's your view on stakeholder involvement? What should be on the face of the bill? And how we make sure it's dynamic and focused at the same time and not unwieldy, but as important as it is? Who wants to take that kick that off? Rachel? I think the, um, one of the very important things that we have to take into account to begin with is what the, what the involvement is for. And I think there are a lot of people who have justifiably a desire and a need to be around the table in different ways. One of the things, and I think it won't surprise you given the evidence that the RCN has put in in writing, is that the bill... Uh, the policy memorandum for the bill is very, very clear on what the bill is trying to achieve, but that isn't always translated into the wording of what's on the face of the bill, and I know as an organisation we're not alone in saying that. One of the key issues for us in the bill is the fact that it doesn't address what we think should be fundamental to any care service, which is issues of quality and issues of safety. And because we think that's missing from the principles of the bill, I think there are other issues that then follow on from that that are also then missing from the face of the bill, including the really important one of how do we give assurance both to you as MSPs, to the governance committees of the, uh, of the different organisations, to local councillors and to the general public that the services that we are commissioning and the services that are being delivered in an integrated way are genuinely safe. I was very interested in the discussions that were happening before um, in your first uh, uh, roundtable this morning um, because uh, the issue around the acute sector came up. And what I noticed, having been working around these issues for the last 18 months, two years, is how often that becomes an issue about acute sector monies rather than about the quality of care that is delivered, which may now be in the community rather than the acute sector. And on the basis of that, it probably won't surprise you to say that I do think, from, from our point of view, clinicians and nurses, as part of that clinician community, do have a fundamental role in ensuring and giving assurance that the quality and safety of care that is delivered 
is absolutely top-notch. And it strikes me as somewhat surprising that given that we're debating this bill post-Francis, that that isn't clearer on the face of the bill. And there should be ways of writing... I think there are many ways that we can do it, but there should be ways of ensuring that primary legislation makes that key and that those who are responsible for assuring that at a local level, whether that is the director of social work or whether that is the director of nursing, have a clear route to give that assurance to those who are governing. I, mean, I, I, mean, I think this, uh, Bob's question, really goes to the basis of, of governance of, of these particular bodies, and I think there is some confusion in this area, particularly given the, uh, the body corporate option on that basis. Uh, from our perspective, um, particularly, it's, it's unclear in relation to the staffing governance. As you will know, in the health service, we have a very strong, internationally renowned uh, staff governance framework there. It's slightly different in, in local government, but nonetheless, there are statutory and non-statutory provisions there. Our concern is there are a lot of big decisions that this body could make if the budgets are allocated to it, which will impact, not as them, because in most cases they won't be the employer, but impacts on other employers. And the, the staff governance arrangements of that seem to me to be somewhat muddled and confused. Uh, an example of that would be um, the, the mess we got into over the police and fire bill that we pointed at the time, and, uh, and that wasn't clear in that bill. And the Justice Committee spent sort of six months dragging the players in to try and sort it out afterwards so I do think that's a lesson to be learned there on that on that basis I think um, I think the risk of leaving it muddled is that uh, as, as others uh, Cosler and others have, have rightly pointed out um, it, the bill has, has a, a massive barrage of powers for ministers uh, reserve powers I think are fine um, you'd expect that in this bill but the powers of direction are immense in my experience the most immense I've seen uh, at any at any time I think the risk is that that might lead if it doesn't deliver for the outcomes that ministers want to top-down integration models. And as we've seen from the work that Spice have done and, and Adswa's um, work on international studies, top-down integration simply doesn't work. Gabriel? Um, yes, I'm from the allied health professions. We represent 12 professional groups, and we're about the same size as medics within Scotland. Um, in the previous panel, they were talking about inclusion within the bills teams, about creating this bill, and, and we haven't been included. We definitely want a seat at the table. We're very, very involved with the rock face of getting people home or in, to remain in the community, and we think that uh, without including us within the decision-making boards, joint boards, uh, there's going to be a real loss in that experience and also the positive contributions that allied health professionals can make. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, the, the issue of stakeholders is a, a, is, is a difficult one, but I, would, I think I would tend to agree with uh, Rachel when <coughs> stakehold, being a stakeholder depends on what you, what you bring to the table. Um, I think what we don't want to do and what I think many of us have concerns about is that we embark on considerable legislation uh, cost, upheaval, and so on, and end up with something perhaps not very different from what we have at the moment. Um, so I think what, what we need to do, in my view, and in the RCGP's view, is to ensure that where we end up in April 2015 is with a system which has the capacity for innovation, for doing things differently, and for releasing the talents and capabilities of all the professionals and uh, service users who, who, are, who are stakeholders. Um, our, in, in terms of the, the partnership boards themselves, I mean, our view is that there, the, there should be some general practice representation there because we are responsible for often making crucial decisions about whether someone stays at home or in a homely setting or goes into hospital. These are crucial decisions and that kind of um, uh, high impact decisions on the way the system works and we feel we should bring that to a table. I, I would hope we'd have some opportunity to talk uh, at, about locality planning and how that is, will function under the new system because I believe that to be fairly really crucial uh, in this bill. Um, the, the bill needs to make a difference to what happens to individuals, clients or patients or service users. I believe that uh, what happens at a locality level 
is probably as important as what happens at a partnership level. And I think it's there we feel that general practitioners and I think also social workers, AHPs, community nurses could have a major role in determining the shaping of services at a local level. I mean, I have more to say on that, but perhaps that would do for now. Dr. McAlpine. Thank you. Uh, I mean, as an acute clinician, obviously, I, I think reasonable awareness of the issues for the acute side, and I was slightly concerned, I suppose, one or two of the comments in the session before this, in terms of, I think it's been said already, about the acute sector being looked at as a source of money that might be moved into the community. I think we have to be conscious that older people in particular, very big users of acute care. And within all of this discussion, I think we have to be aware that an unplanned admission is not necessarily a bad thing. I think the word avoidable needs to come in somewhere. There's a lot talked about, about the cost of unplanned admissions, but a lot of those are people with acute stroke, heart attacks, pneumonia, etc. And clearly they're going to continue, and they are expensive because hospital care is expensive. I think, certainly from a geriatrician point of view, I think we welcome integration and we think what we should be doing is looking at smoother pathways. I think if you talk particularly <coughs> to older people, they say what concerns them is the extent to which people hang about, you wait for things, you don't know how to get things. I think we could look at how you make systems better. I think the role of HPs is absolutely key to that. And I suppose if I were looking at stakeholders, I would say, well, if you're looking at who should be at the table, what are they there for? And I think that both health and social care gets a bit bedeviled by lobbying groups. Excuse me, lobbying groups who are there for a purpose. I think if you want to look at how do you make the care of all patient groups, just older people or all patient groups, depending on what you're looking at, how do you make that most efficient and most effective? Because I think that's what the, the consumers are looking for. No, no, Ruth. Yes. Um, I would like to approach it from thinking about where the interface of health and social care actually is. And for the social worker who's getting involved in this kind of integrated process, it's about working with people who are facing change in their lives. And I think that's where the starting point should be in terms of trying to measure where we're going with this piece of legislation. And from the social work perspective, the, we're interested in three um, issues. One is about the prevention of somebody, for example, going into acute services. Um, we're also interested in people uh, in social protection, which is a very key part of our role. And I think one of the things that I've consistently said from our perspective is one of the un unintended consequences of this legislation may be some of the effect it will have on our responsibility in terms of social protection. And I'm thinking particularly, for example, of child protection, of children um, whose parents are detained under the Mental Health Act, the issues about the human rights issues for people who are detained under the Mental Health Act, their rights to live in the community, and, 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 and issues like that. And I'm also concerned about the third P, which is participation the people who are in the driving seat, and they need to be the people who are using our services. Um, and I was very struck by some recent evidence from the Mental Welfare Commission um, that the, uh, w the development of the Edinburgh Crisis Centre in, um, in terms of helping people to stay in the community but remain part, but, but to have the... Um, <coughs> The, the, and the necessary intervention of a compulsory treatment order has meant that there have been less hospital admissions in the Edinburgh area and people are being treated out in the community. Now, that seems to me to be a really good example of people moving into this, addressing the issue of prevention, protection and participation. And I think that there is an issue here about does your stakeholder body that you're talking about, does it address those kind of issues? Um, and, and I think that this, the, the importance of the evidence you were hearing this morning from the people who are using services is their need to be involved as in the driving seat about what is actually happening to them. And anything that happens from our services has to feed into, the, into that particular um, message. Dr. Taylor. 
Hi, uh, I'm here representing mental health services, but first of all, I'd like to answer the question. I think the board, in terms of health and social care partnerships, must represent the health and social care partnership, and there must be a corporate governance, a clear understanding that every member of that board has got a responsibility as a member of that board to represent everybody, not just to be there as special interest groups. I mean, that would be my expectation from health boards, and I assume the same would apply you know, in terms of you know, local authorities. I think there is a requirement for wider consultation in terms of stakeholders. Uh, we need to involve everybody. Those groups will involve a wide range. I know locally, you know, our patient and service user uh, you know, group you know, would like to be represented and would like to have representation on each of the health and social care partnerships. The, you know, and you need to have mechanisms for that. One of the concerns in terms of mental health is that we will not have representation because not everyone's going to be represented. And if you do, you get a non-functional group. I mean, I've been to large groups where you've got chiropodists, podiatrists, dentists, you know, mental health position, uh, professionals, uh, people dealing with you know, older people services. And actually, if there's too many people there, it doesn't function. But I think these are more practical organization issues which will be you know, sorted out locally. Oh, just briefly, I know there's a lot of questions we want to get through. I'm, I'm kind of struck by the fact that most of the witnesses didn't focus on structures. You focused on how uh, your stakeholder group could be actively involved in improving and changing um, service and I think Dr Gillies gave an interesting suggestion that it's about the locality planning that most stakeholders are interested in and I think Dr Taylor also mentioned that distinguishing between the corporate governance of the strategic board and uh, interest groups within locality planning is there is, is the feeling amongst most of the witnesses that uh, the majority of the stakeholder involvement should be focused at a local level getting the local the locality planning correct which would then be signed off by the strategic board uh, and just to get a feel for that. I mean, I, I know if we ground everyone again, it will it'll be rather time consuming, which I think makes the point about how can everyone sit on a strategic board and have focused decision making. So is it more about locality planning for most of the stakeholders? Well, you put the question out there, we'll just need to take the risk about who comes <laughs> in, Bob. But, and I see Rachel making a bid and uh, Dr. Gillis making a bid. And I think locality planning is key, and I think the bill is um, fairly sketchy on what that is, and I don't think we yet entirely understand how locality planning will work in practice. I know that we have been told it is the way for professions to get involved, and we would disagree with that, because I do think whilst it's very important that those with the local knowledge on the ground of the locality that they're working in are engaged in the development of that, whether that's the service provider or whether that's the person using the service is key, we have to understand how that process fits to the, as you were talking earlier this morning, to the Joint Strategic Commissioning process, which is a very powerful process and will be making decisions about investment and disinvestment and will need to be assured that whatever is commissioned is safe and quality care. And the link from that to the governance boards and then back up to the partner agencies to ensure similarly that we do have good care, quality care delivered by the right people in the right place according to the needs that have been identified. So whilst yes, I think locality planning is absolutely key and an important role for really wide involvement, if it becomes the only focus for involvement, then I really do think we start missing out on assurance mechanisms and important strategic oversights that, that professionals and others will have to support the governance of these new bodies. Dave? I, I'm, I, we've argued in our, in our submission and, and elsewhere that, uh, that services should be designed from the bottom up uh, in conjunction with users and staff. Uh, and that was obviously a, a key element, the Christie Commission report as well. And, and turning that into, into practice is not easy. Um, there is a tendency, I think, to look for top-down solutions all the time, and, and clearly we wouldn't support that. I think we're talking about locality planning. I think we do need to see detail. I think part of the problem with locality planning uh, very often in Scotland has been, hasn't been very 
very local. Uh, in other words, there are genuine localities, and we sometimes haven't drilled down services to those levels, largely because our local authorities and health boards are very large. I know there are those who argue there should be fewer of them, um, but we're not one of those, uh, um, because actually we have the, you know, the, the largest ones in Europe on that basis. But I do agree, Rach, in terms of it's, it, my concern is that, given the powers that are in the bill for ministers and the strategic role there, that actually the scope of localities to design could be prescribed by that, by that top-down driver. So I do think you do need to have a reasonable input into the strategic side as well as the local. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with anything that uh, Rachel had said, but I think what we're talking about is a kind of, and also not an, an either or, of course you need some professional involvement at the you know, quality assurance, strategic commissioning level, but actually where things will make a difference to individual patients and clients will be at localities. And um, I think effective partnership and coordination of professionals, the public and service users at a locality level will be really important. And I think, uh, convener, it's important that the bill allows that sort of subsidiarity to enable that to, uh, to happen. I think also, one of the things that I think the, the Francis report has been mentioned in response to the East Staffordshire uh, tragedy. I think since then we've had two interesting reviews from England, the Berwick report and the report of Sir Bruce Keogh on really hospital services essentially in England. But what came through from both these reports is that it's not all about structures, it's, it's really about proper culture and working relationships on the ground. That's what determines quality and then your regulation and so on. But determining what happens and having good relationships at a locality level, I think will really decide whether this bill is a success or not. Um, and I think that, that means the right sort of professional involvement, including the groups around the table. And also some involvement with communities in the community planning process as well. And we have models, which Ian mentioned, of engaging communities um, and the, uh, using the access to local uh, services through the Alice search engine, which I think could contribute to this. Thanks. Dr McCall. I, mean, I agree with what's been said already. I think our view would be that there should be some kind of strategic overview and key deliverables or goals. I think from the locality point of view, I think we have to acknowledge, even looking at the older population, that some bits of Scotland have a very elderly population, some are sort of younger, older, and or prematurely aged. Looking at bits of Glasgow versus bits of other areas of Scotland, I think locality planning is key to that, to see what are the particular needs locally for that population. One of the things that I think could usefully be done would be looking at what was funded via the Change Fund, which has also been mentioned already this morning, because I think most people would acknowledge that some things funded by the Change Fund have worked extremely well, some have worked a bit less well, and some of that has been to do with a bit of reluctance to share things. So I think that could be looked at. My view, I think, and our organisation view would be that the, the key to all this will be trust, that we have to have people in the locality planning groups who trust one another, so service users, carers, professionals and so on, are able to work together, reach agreement and move forward on that. Um, yeah, I, th I think there needs to be both, actually, for, for allied health professionals. I think definitely the local planning is really, really important, but in order to have good strategies, you need to understand the workforce and I think that uh, having an allied health professional director, we have one in each health board now, would be a really useful mechanism. You get one person for 12 professions in order to be able to understand the potential of that workforce as well. We already work across health and social care, we work in housing um, and we work in the third sector, education. So we've got a, quite an integrated professional body there that could really help to shift this balance as well. Dr Taylor. I think just in support of what I said earlier, I think, you know, initially the question I was answering was about locality plan planning. I was taking for granted that we would have the best clinical governance structures around which would involve all clinicians. They actually need to be widened to actually include local authority responsibilities as well, including elements of purchase, you know, governance of purchase services, the legislation, particular issues of local authority. So you need to expand it to develop a concept of care governance. But it, that 
element does need to be there, and it is, you know, key. I think any health board would expect that there would be robust clinical governance structures developed for any service that it's involved in. Gil, thank you for your patience. You <clears throat> come in. It's in the same theme, uh, Aiken Vina. I think uh, Dr John Taylor came nearest to the first person saying who shouldn't be on the joint boards uh, in his first comments that he made. And almost every submission that we've had has talked about this never being about bureaucracy and about structures, and yet everyone practically we're hearing wants to be on that joint board. Uh, and the point I would make uh, and ask a question on is that since the, the health service itself is so diverse uh, and all the different functions that are within that, and then if you go into social work and see all the different sectors within social work, I mean, they are massively uh, uh, diverse in their operation. And yet, this, on the face of it, is only the, the board is going to be consist of only these two sectors, these two big vested interest groups. So I wondered if, uh, since the private uh, sector or the voluntary sector, uh, since uh, you know they make up the third leg of this partnership, I believe, is there enough room for maybe even just one person to represent? that, you know, everyone else as against the, the, the two big vested interests that, that we are trying to bring together to deliver better services. And my question is, does anyone else get any opinion who shouldn't be on rather than who should be on? Well, that's a fair question, but anyway. Are you going to answer that, Rhoda? No, no, no. Can I just add to that, just uh, additional to that? I think that's a good question, but... Do we need everybody on the board if we have the, the mechanisms right, I suppose, and where people are empowered to make decision, decisions right down to the service user at ground level? Is it about being on the board or is it about having the structures right about where those decisions that affect individuals come in? Does that, does that take us to the comparisons that will be, you know, the lead agency or the corporate body model? Or... Dave? I mean, the, the obvious answer is, is uh, who shouldn't be on boards, everyone other than the people we want on the board, of course. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fairly easy judgment, really. Um, but um, more, more serious, I think the, 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 the difficulty is, and I think it makes a very fair point, there are an awful lot of diverse interests here on that basis. I think what, what I would say, and part of the problem that it boils down to the governance structure, if we go for the body corporate option, um, if, it's a, if it's a lead authority, there are, there are established and maybe need to be developed as previous speakers have said. We're talking about the body corporate option. The difficulty there, I think, is by putting another element, whoever that might be, it'd be, it'd be the ones we've argued for or others, it upsets the, the rather delicately planned corporate governance structure for that, because essentially uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's aimed at being a balance between the health boards and the local authorities and the alternating chair and all those types of arrangements. And I think you put another body in. I, you know, I think it is very important we get full user engagement. I said that, obviously, I I'll also argue that the staff who deliver the services have a very important role in, in terms of influencing those as well. I think sometimes on, uh, my, my point is how it's users. Not, not the other delivery uh, arms, because sometimes there's a confusion um, between those in the charitable sector who deliver services in a semi-commercial way uh, and those who are representing many of the ones you, you've met this morning who are representing user interests and, and have, have no commercial interest in the delivery of service. I think we do need to separate those two off, and sometimes there's confusion uh, in, the, in, that, in that particular field. Bobby? I suppose I just wanted to make the point as well is that if we're wanting to change the culture, we need to change the people that are sitting around the table. Uh, if you're just simply bringing the people that have sat around the table in the council with the people who sat around the table within a health board, you're not going to get effective change, I don't think. So I do think we need to bring in, um, well, obviously allied health professionals, but other professionals and, and users within that group to make different decisions because it is about different decisions. Dr. McCall. I would agree with that entirely. I think it's back to, as I said earlier, you have to look at what are the people there for. And I think a lot of things historically have been done by lobbying groups. And you have, I don't know, dementia versus learning disability versus the arthritis groups and so on. 
and some of that relates to finances and the perception of financial things. I think for a board like that, you have to have people who are there with a key remit to be working towards particular goals of integrating services and not there with a particular lobbying group hat on or representative group hat on, but able then to consult other parties, consult other relevant people and come back. I mean, for example, just looking at allied health professions, you clearly couldn't possibly have somebody from every allied health profession, but you do need somebody who can then go back from looking at acute side from primary care. You want people who are there with a remit to communicate, to make joint decisions with a, a clear goal of why these decisions are being made. Rachel? I, I would agree that I would come back in, in answering the question to the first point I made of, of, of what, what is it that people are, are around the table to do and to pick up on Dr Taylor's point around care governance um, or clinical governance as we would have called it in the NHS. There is a really important point there about how do we ensure the governance of our services is right from a care point of view. Now, we do have an issue, and I think there are lots of these issues within the bill we haven't really ironed out, in that we're trying to bring together two quite different organisations. So from a health point of view, we would, as a matter of course, have a director of nursing on every board who would have a responsibility for the quality of care being delivered in that board and is, is an ultimate assurance mechanism within that board for the quality of care. That is a matter of course within the governance situation of the NHS. That is not replicated in councils who work on a very different level and where the, the director of social work doesn't have quite the same role because of the structures of local democracy. What we've got is a board that's proposed in its loosest sense um, within the bill to bring two different mechanisms together where the expectations of how we may assure that governance will be slightly different. The director of social work clearly has a role, or chief social worker has a role in terms of giving clear advice to, the, to local councils, but it's not in quite the same way as a director of nursing would as an executive member of an NHS board. So we really have to grapple with what does that mean in the body corporate model, particularly when we're creating a new body and we have to remember that the strategic plan of that body in the bill as it's written at the moment does not have to get signed off from the parent bodies. It's signed off at that level with a lot of responsibility given to that board to make sure that the services it is designing and planning for the future are the right services and fit for the local population. So I think it keeps coming back to that question is why are people around the table? What is their function in the governance of particularly the body corporate model? Ruth? Yes, I want to return to pick up on, on the issue, of the last point about governance, but also the one that Dave re, re, uh, introduced about governance in relation to the chief, um, uh, the chief of where does this chief officer sort of sit um, in this integrated model, and to uh, remind people that actually there are some very specific responsibilities that the chief social work officer has which are statutory responsibilities that relate to uh, people's um, liberty in terms of the powers around child protection, the powers around detention of people under the mental health legislation, and um, the advice that's given to courts in terms of criminal justice. And I think there's some very key issues here which are not, and I would reinforce, they are not the same as the health service responsibilities. Um, and when I looked at the uh, legislation in relation to the, um, where this person who will be the chief of this integrated body, I was left with the question, and I don't know the answer to the question, about who is chief of what and who is chief of some of these other statutory responsibilities that fall to the social work profession, um, and how do they fit fit into this integrated plan um, because there are some issues where I could see there could be a conflict between the chief of the integrated body and the chief social work officer responsibilities and indeed I think you could probably have conflict within the health uh, elements of that in terms of the statutory responsibilities uh, that certain people have within the, that body and I didn't feel there was clarity in that um, governance structure that's that's uh, that's there, and I couldn't see where this was taking us. 
uh, beyond some of the uh, principles that were outlined in the Social Work Scotland Act, or that were at, outlined in the Children's Act, have been at, outlined in the mental health legislation, the um, adults with uh, incapacity legislation, uh, adult care and support. All of these things are critical issues that involve social care, social work decisions, and how do they work in this new legislation that's being proposed, and who has that? How, how has that governance worked out? And I and I didn't see there was clarity in that governance. You want to enjoy? Just a comment, a sort of a background comment, which I think is important because I haven't heard it raised. That in looking at the evolution of uh, of these the partnerships and the locality planning groups, um, most people who work for or to local authorities and health boards are employees. I think it's important to to record that most general practitioners and indeed some other community groups like pharmacists are contractors. So we contract, we work for the National Health Service according to a contract but are not employees. And when one looks at um, the way in which uh, GPs and perhaps other primary care contractors like pharmacists would contribute to this sort of arrangements, it would be important to remember that they would need some additional support because if a GP has to leave her practice for an afternoon to attend a group, then that GP would have to be replaced by a locum. So these sort of support arrangements need to be considered uh, in, the, in looking at, um, in looking at uh, how, uh, how we contribute to the, to the future. I think much of this is covered in the All Hands on Deck report, which was produced for the, the Joint Improvement Team. Um, but if it is to function, I think GPs would have to be supported to, uh, to, to attend these meetings. So uh, it would be important to include that in some way. We're at that, that stage where everybody round about the table and all the evidence we've had said that integration is a good idea. Politicians have tried in the past to bring about that integration and have not been successful. So I think we're all... Maybe we don't, but we're all, we're all here, except that maybe it's a bit of frustration that we've got legislation to try and fix something that hasn't happened generically, or, you know, the, the, the cultural change that we've got. So maybe is a legislation necessary, in your view, why haven't we made the progress without the legislation? And how do we create, the whole list of questions here, how do we create the cultural change that is needed? Is it, as we've heard earlier, more positive, enforceable human rights for the clients that are using this service that creates a different sort of environment at, uh, at, 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 at a corporate board level? Is it incentivisation? Is it a change in the GP contract? What are, all the, what are the practical things that we need to do to actually improve the, 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 the experience and the quality and the outcome for people out there who are in the seat of this care? Because when we spoke to people on the ground yesterday, they're very enthused about what they can do. They feel liberated by the Highland experience. But we know from our visit there yesterday, it's a long-term experience. You know, the real hard choices maybe about redesign or further down the line. And it, you know, but what do we do? If we accept that this needs to change and if legislation is not the, the process, then how, how are we going to do that? John, go on. Well, okay, well, I'll take up the challenge. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, we believe in RCGP that this legislation is absolutely necessary and welcome and overdue. Um, we, wh wh where we are now with our increased expectations and appropriate expectations of health and social care, uh, the, the demographic shift to more elderly population, the rise in complexity and multimorbidity in, among patients with long-term conditions, and the deprivation Scotland has. We don't actually currently have a health system or a social care system designed to address these problems. And I think the legislation should help go some way to addressing that. Um, 
And people don't distinguish as service users or patients between a health need and a social care need. You know, that's, that's been the case for many years. I remember starting in general practice being carefully explained the difference between a health bath and a social care bath, you know, and I thought it was just yeah. an old buddy who needed a bath, really. So, so I think it's absolutely necessary, and I think all the things you mentioned, I think we need some sort of, for, for general practice, we need the continued development of a Scottish con focused contract to ensure that the skills and innovation uh, of GPs can be used outside their practices and at the interfaces with secondary care and social care. We need culture shifts. And I, the reason I keep talking about locality planning is because I think the culture change has to happen at a locality level. I don't think you can impose culture change from the top. If you look at what's happened in England with the hospital service, that's what was attempted and it failed. So I think a combination of um, helpful changes at a partnership level and strong localities to help shape the service of the way forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Rachel, Dave, Dr McAlpine. Good. I mean, we've been very clear at the RCN that um, we should see services that are seamless wherever you are. I agree people are not going to see the difference between health and social care when you're receiving a service. The difficulty we have at the moment is our health and social care services are configured so differently within such different paradigms that to bring those together is a real challenge. Do we need the bill? Well, I think there are certainly things within the bill and particularly within the policy memorandum that we support absolutely. There are things that do need to change and there are some supports that need to be put in place. As I've already said, I think the translation from the policy memorandum to the bill we have is not always as clear as it could be. And I do have some concerns that as the committee, assuming we could get through stage one, goes into stage two, that we may end up with an awful lot of amendments being put down to the bill, which I hope le leaves us with a bill of integrity at the end of it. I think there are many, many examples where things are already working very, very well. We certainly have examples within nursing and social work teams where people are working together very well on the ground. And our difficulty at the moment in taking that forward and expanding that is that quite often that re needs, for example, time. And time is a very expensive commodity in the public and third sectors and private sectors at the moment. Um, I can remember some years ago going to an event where um, at the beginning of the single outcome agreements, we held an event for nurses, lead nurses talking about the impact of planning and the single outcome agreements and, and some of the things that they maybe should be thinking about. And I remember talking to two nurses one who was working in an area where she said that she felt integrated working wasn't working very well, and one who did. And the difference that really came down to is these two nurses, very close to each other geographically, talking about their different experiences, was the amount of time that had been freed up in their teams to allow real simple things to happen, like for a, a social worker and a community nurse, a district nurse, to be able to sit down and explain to each other the limits of practice within their regulatory bodies. What were they actually allowed to do and not allowed to do to allow proper work to actually happen between them? I would agree with John. I think there are some things, some of those big cultural shifts that will have to happen locally, but they will mean ensuring, first of all, that there is enough resource wherever you work, whether you're an independent contractor or not, to have the, if you like, the organisational development support and space for that to happen. We are asking our frontline staff to work very differently. We should be asking our frontline support to work very differently, and we therefore should be committed to make sure they have the resources to do that. And we would also say that all the way up the chain, to the very, very top, we need to make sure that that push towards integrated working across two very different systems at the moment is seen at every single level and is valued at every single level. So whether that comes down to how at a national level we're talking about the differences between what goes through this bill, our community planning processes, what may be going through the children's bill in terms of planning for children, matches up and is as seamless at that level as it is for what we expect of our frontline practitioners on the ground. Because unless all of that works together, nobody will make this work. Anyone, anyone else? Dave, sorry. Uh, well, the risk of dismaying you even further, Duncan, I'm afraid I have a slide that I use at conferences and uh, uh, on this subject, uh, which lists 
all the initiatives and legislation on this issue over recent years. And, and believe you me, it's a very small print to fit them all in. Uh, I, I reckon, on average, it's something like an initiative every 18 months in, in recent years on, 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 uh, in this area. And, uh, yeah, to be honest, if you talk to staff at the sharp end there, when about this bill, as, as I have done in, in, in groups and, uh, of, our, of our representatives, and they, and they would tell you the frontline staff view is, here we go again. Um, another moving around of the managerial deck chairs, um, and is it really going to make a, a huge amount of difference? That's the honest appraisal that, that, uh, that staff will give you at, at the sharp end. Uh, and interestingly, um, I, when it's broken down in the current, current structure, uh, which it has done, you know, it works well in some areas, it has broken down with others. Very often, I went to one um, local authority, which remained nameless, where it did break down with the health board, uh, and the staff actually at the sharp end said, actually, we just got on with it anyway, uh, and we muddled through, and um, it would be nice if it had been, you know, if the high hygienists could get it sorted, but actually, you know, we just got, went on and delivered the services. Uh, and, and sadly, I think that is the reality. If you look, uh, to be perhaps more helpful, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at the, um, the international studies um, on that, there are a, a long list, I won't give you them, but I mean, they're, they're in our, our submission and others, uh, but they're about getting the relationships right, about respecting professional identity, about allowing management, getting the staff uh, engagement right on, on, on that basis. And, but there are two themes that come out of all that work. And I have to say, you know, I've been, I've been involved in this for more years than I, than I care, care, to, care to imagine, and was an expert advisor to the Christie Commission that looked at it very, very, very closely. Two things hit me with it. One is, uh, as John was saying, it's a bottom-up design. There is no top-down, one-size-fits-all solution that's going to work. And the second thing, it's about people. Uh, and, you know, if you read the bill, um, there's about one clause about staff. The memorandum has, a, has a half a paragraph. The consultation paper went to 64 pages and had half a page on staff. Um, so my general message would be that, you know, if we're going to make care integration work, we've got to get the people bits right. And I think there's too much focus, frankly, on, on structures and budgets and not enough on people. Dr McComp and then Malcolm, I think, wants on. Thank you. I mean, again, I think similar to what other people have said, I think geriatricians feel that while we are keen to ensure that older people access acute care when they need it, we are also aware that some people don't need to be in hospital, but certainly some people who are in hospital could leave it more promptly. And I think we have to be aware that a big part of this work is to try to look at how we deal with the increasingly elderly population and the fact that we simply cannot afford to have all these people in hospital in the future. And I, I think that is a big imperative. I think there is a concern sometimes that it all comes down to if you have all these different organisations, if you can get somebody else to deal with it, then that's something shifted out of somebody's responsibility. I think we have to look at and learn from places as we talked about earlier with Highland, there's also the Compass Service in Lothian through the Change Fund, which is very much looking at all the different organisations, primary care, secondary care, social work, looking at how you take joint responsibility for improving services and try to work together with everyone involved with this sort of common goal of improving efficiency and effectiveness of services. And I think there are places where it has worked. And I think we are probably not always terribly good at spreading information around different places. And then it does come back to staff thinking, well, that's this week's initiative and there'll probably be another one along next week and more pilots than the RAF and all these other comments that you get from staff, unfortunately. I'll come. I mean, I suppose I was just prompted by what Dave said, the last contribution, but one, I mean, I suppose it's a question to him, but it's a more general point. I mean, what is is this legislation necessary because if you know it has to be bottom up and if structural change isn't the answer you know is it necessary but i suppose more generally what positive things can we get out of this legislation i mean obviously we've had some contributions on that already but i suppose one of the other things that interested me from the rcn uh, submission was the whole issue about quality and whether people would agree that we can use we ought to be building more explicitly into the legislation about quality and i suppose the other thing about the rcn contribution which it is perhaps not featuring strongly in other ones, but relates to other work we're doing in the Parliament, is to what extent is it, is it right or wrong to separate this off from the, all the work on children's legislation? So I'm kind of interested in that area as well. But as I say, I was prompted by Dave's contribution. I mean, 
perhaps he can tell me, does he actually think this legislation contributes anything, or is it just something that he and his members have to put up with? <laughs> I, I, I suspect I, I, I veer towards the latter, but um, it, 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 at the end of the day, I think it can be useful as long as it is um, enabling legislation which sets, a, which sets a framework. But all I'm really saying to you is that there's not much in the legislation which actually tackles what you need to do to get health integration right. So if you think the legislation and all the words that you put in it are going to cut the ice, um, I'm sorry to say it probably won't. Um, it's all the other things that we talk about that will cut it. I mean, and, and quality, I entirely agree with the issue around quality, but, you know, we talk about healthcare integration. There is a national disgrace going on in this country at the moment, and that is the way that care, particularly in the community, is delivered. It is being delivered by staff generally on the minimum wage, sometimes not even that, and certainly not the living wage. They are trekking around, trying to cover... I mean, I did a, group, a meeting with a group of members the other day and said to them, what about the 15-minute care visit? And one of the staff said to me, 15? minutes that's a luxury uh, you should see what I'm having to do on a day-to-day -day basis now that's because you know money is already tight in these areas we can write lovely phrases in legislation about quality and I'm, I'm all for them they're great but you know unless we address the fact that we're going to have to find another 2.5 billion pounds by 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 2030 to meet the the additional costs that are coming down this road when we're already not meeting those costs and the consequences of quality of care which is the real disgrace so I think my question my answer would be yes, by all means pass legislation, put some warm words in there, but if you want to do something about it, you've got to sort out issues like the way care is being del delivered on the ground. Thanks, Dave. We did have an attempt in a previous report from the committee. We might have a... Um, Ruth, and then Gabby. I just wanted to agree with Dave, because that's what our members are saying too. But I also wanted to talk about something that hasn't actually been mentioned at, at the moment. There's an assumption that we're talking about people who are engaged already in health and social care services. And one of the tasks that our members do is to go out and reach out to people who are not engaged in these services. And they don't seem to be factored into here. We've got very articulate carers, we've got very articulate service users. We've got an awful lot of people out there who are not engaged and, are, not, uh, and are, are, are affecting these statistics, particularly in places like Glasgow, about poor health and so on. And these are the people that our members are going out and reaching out to. And I do think that somehow we seem to have factored them out of this discussion and, and out of this legislation. I don't know how we engage with them, but if you're talking about stakeholders who need to be listened to, they're also stakeholders that need to be listened to. Uh, yes, my point was just around the fact that, um, oh, a bit of a mental block, uh, what you were saying about including, um, sorry, I've lost what my train of thought because I was so busy listening to you, about include, including um, allied health professionals because um, they, keeping people at home is what we're wanting to do and saving government money is what we wanted to do and we actually have quite a lot of evidence to back up the fact that if you include allied health professionals in um, services, um, they um, certainly do uh, create a cost saving. And what you were mentioning about some of the change funds that have gone on in good examples, uh, I've got my thought back again, is, the, is around that evidence base and being much more evidence based in, in what we do. So looking at things that have worked well and working out what staff ratios made that work well and sharing that that good practice is really fundamentally important. And I think the bill, although we really welcome it, doesn't talk about that quality, doesn't, the, the um, principles are good, but I think they're not um, expanded enough. And that the, the well-being, what does well-being mean? And I think that that's, that there are risks involved in the bill as well, that it is purely mechanistic and not something that's going to actually create the change that we want to happen. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have to say. I, I suppose the other bit was around staff and, and this here we go again was around the fact that um, a lot of our staff report that they're already working in a very integrated way, but it's the systems that stop them from working together. So things like not having computers that communicate with each other. We had the single shared assessment, but people couldn't share that assessment because other than in written form. And I think in this day and age, we need to talk about integration in, in regards to uh, some of the technologies that we use and look at some of the barriers that stop that from happening on the ground. 
Mitchell, you were name checked a couple of times with Malcolm. I think you. And it won't surprise Malcolm to know the RCN agrees with the RCN submission uh, that quality should definitely be on the face of the bill. Um, I think really it was it was picking up on some of the previous points. I mean, certainly the, the points around what's not in the bill and things like IT integration, talking to our members, and there's a report on our website from a member conference that we ran where IT came so high up the list. You know, we have a system where frontline practitioners are being asked to share care and actually they can't share a record. That doesn't make much sense. Um, so there are things that have to happen that are outside of the bill and we can't expect legislation to deal with. In terms of what Dave was saying around um, the social care visits, certainly our interest in terms of seeing quality put into the bill, I hope it would be more than warm words and it would certainly be more than about looking at quality in terms of healthcare. And one of the reasons we think it should go in is that one of the consequences of this, this bill, I think if you take it to its logical conclusion, is that we will go down a line of commissioning, which is almost certainly going to involve increased procurement. Now, we do have some questions to ask about the, which bits of the budget will go down a line of procurement and which might not. And I know some of that has been dealt with through conversations on self-directed support. But on the basis of an increased uh, culture of procurement, um, we should be making sure that contracting, which will be held and delivered through these new commissioning routes, should have quality and uh, of the quality of care as central to those contracts. We should not be contracting on the base of cost alone. And I know we have to be pragmatic and realistic in the landscape that we, were, we are in, which is that the public sector does not have the money it used to even with what are seen as protected NHS budgets. Not even the NHS has the money it used to because costs are spiralling. And on that basis, we do have to make sure that there is something to counterbalance what will be an inevitable and what we can see now, which is a tendency to contract on price. That is not good enough. It cannot be good enough, and we need to write something into the bill to deal with that. The second issue, which is the one of staffing, and I think this picks up something that was said at the very end of your first session, was a question that was asked around the, 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 the capacity or capability of staff. And I do think that does come very centrally into what we're talking about here and why we need to think quite differently about services and why perhaps we haven't quite got there in the way we would have liked yet. And that is down to the fact that if we are talking about taking services from a health side out of the acute sector, and locating them in the community. We need a community clinical staff group that is equipped with the right skills in the right place to deliver that level of care. Now we can see in some areas there are, there are developments like the virtual wards that are going ahead, the hospital at home services that are being del delivered and developed um, across partnerships. And they're very, very important early leaders in how we might go about doing this. But there is a question of, are we investing enough in making sure that we have the skills that should therefore be able to deliver good quality care for people who need it, which will become ever more complex given the demography that we're dealing with in the community? And I would suggest we're really not quite there yet. A couple, a couple of things out there. The, the, there's um, two million in the financial um, memorandum of the bill for Health and social care, IT. It, my understanding is that's existing money. I know that there is there is work going ahead to look at coming up with a, an integrated IT strategy by <coughs> 2014. Um, that is just one year before this is due to go live as a as a as a process. Um, whether that's enough, given the problems that our members would tell us they're seeing on the ground, I, I, I wait with bated breath. I asked the question in the knowledge that it's never enough, so I should be, you know, so I'm not... Uh, Dr Taylor? Right, I'll, I'll come back to the original question. Is legislation required? In terms of, you know, our members, you know, surprisingly few, if any, psychiatrists actually said it wasn't required, partly because I think it was answering the question, is integration a good thing? And generally they felt it was a good thing. And um, in many ways, the history of mental health since the 1960s has to be to close large psychiatric hospitals, move services into community, develop community mental health teams with uh, you know, social workers being core members of that team uh, as often as not. So a lot of what 
people are trying to achieve within mental health, uh, the best examples of mental health working already within Scotland have gone a long, long way down that route. Obviously, there's variations in different areas. I suppose the main concerns has been around uh, if there's going to be disintegration, and one of the issues is around the number of local authorities and health boards. Uh, and, you know, is 32 the right number? Is it too large? Is it too small? Uh, probably matters less that there's a different number of health, you know, the actual number than the fact you've got different numbers of health boards and local authorities. So you've got one, uh, you know, what you want is coherence uh, and actually are you going to have different local authority and health and social care partnerships within the self-health board developing different services or is there going to be some cohesion and if you go back to the Christie report often that was talking about different local authorities working in partnership over areas and I think an opportunity has been missed to actually encourage partnership working and it's having some uh, agreed strategy and agreed coherence about systems. Already in terms of local authorities, they will commission some services, certainly out of our services, across several different health board areas. We've heard other examples, uh, you know, uh, around. It's generally considered a good idea. A lot of what happens with mental health, you know, happens out of ours, and therefore you do need to commission that over, uh, you know, larger areas, and certainly uh, often individual local authority areas would not be sufficient. And even for their own services, in terms of mental health officer services, they will often commission these across several different local authorities. Thank you. Um, on the IT point, I think we, we made the same point about the need for systems that shared information across the boundaries and one hopes that uh, as you say there's never enough money for IT and the NHS is famous for for throwing money away in IT certainly in NHS England but we hope that the bill will be a driver towards pushing that process forward uh, on the issue of capacity um, which is brought up by Dave and by by Rachel um, I spoke to a GP in a Leith last night, who had been on call on Friday during the day, uh, she had had over 60 patient contacts on the phone, home visits, uh, and in surgery, and she felt that that was the limit, really, of beyond, uh, possibly beyond the limit of what could be safely dealt with during the day. And this was in a fully staffed surgery in Leith. So I think if we're talking about doing more in the community, adding responsibilities to clinicians, doctors and nurses in the community, that will have to be very carefully thought through if it is to work. There would be no point in saying we need to look after more people in the community and not having the capacity, the clinical capacity, and that, I think I would include AHPs in that, to deal with, to deal with the resulting workload that ensued. Um, again, I think there are innovative ways of working, and virtual wards are one of these that could be used to develop capacity, but we feel certainly in general practice that there is a need to increase the number of GPs to deal with the demographic change and of which, which integration will play a part. Can I pick up on some of the, the, the points that Rachel um, raised in terms of uh, quality? the impact of commissioning and procurement on that, 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 that quality. And, and um, thinking back to a report on the elderly care, um, you know, the, the whole issue of national care standards, more than, what, a day, 10, 12 years old now? Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, something, I think it was accepted by the Scottish Government, that there was, you know, a necessary review in the committee's recommendation. What, what, have, is anybody aware about what's happening in, in, in that review? Rachel, go on. My understanding is we're now waiting to early next year for the review to begin. I think there's work that has started. Um, I know that there have been a few uh, public participation and clinician participation events around Scotland. But I do, I would agree that, that um, with what I think your question is coming from, which is we have a, an issue, which is if what we're going to have is a lot of local variation, which we're all talking about the importance of this being very much locally led, is that that should still mean that wherever you are in Scotland, you should be assured of a standard of care that is a national standard, even if the way in which those standards are delivered locally is very different. And we are, like you, concerned, I think, that we're now still waiting for the care standards to be updated 
um, and made relevant to the, to the situation that we're all working in and receiving services in now. And I think we should also remember that those care standards at the moment, which are very setting specific, don't necessarily cover all the areas of the journey that somebody may go through from being at home with very low level services to being in a hospital with high levels of acute service. Um, so I would be very keen to see, as I understood that we would, that the, the two things would happen in parallel. And certainly, maybe we should be looking in terms of the bill. We know that the, that the integration plans and the strategic plans must have regards to the outcomes and the principles. But perhaps there's also an argument there for them to have regard to care standards as set by the Scottish Government. Has anybody got a view on that? Is that a view it's supported? Or? Absolutely, but I think you remember we did have a review of the social care procurement guidance and, and the rest of it, and frankly it's had no impact at all. We are still on a day-to-day -day basis seeing, and you can see it, you can ask uh, us in terms of direct our members in the voluntary sector and the members even in the private sector, and they'll all say exactly the same. Essentially, there's a race to the bottom in that area. Standards are not the issue, it's how it can be delivered at the cheapest price. So, Gabby to let you know that we're actually, the AHP um, FS are developing quality service uh, values for all our, our staff and uh, they should be um, uh, introduced in the next couple of weeks, I think. So. Thanks, Anna. Ruth, did you want to come yes, in? Yes, I, I think it's very, very, all very well talking about the standards that are set. Um, there's also the issue about the inspection regimes that go ahead, that, 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 that are in place to measure um, the, the quality of care um, and I think that they do fall very short of um, actually doing the task that they are uh, empowered to do, partly because uh, authorities and, and, and workplaces don't want their dirty linen washed in public, and that um, the quality of, and, and, and actually getting to the root of what some of the issues are in care inspections um, is, is a very complex task and I don't think it's re sufficiently resourced or some of the methods are not getting to what the issues are, that are in, in some of the care situations that we see. And I think that it leads to unsafe practice. Um, and, and I think that there are some issues that I know that as an association we've tried to take up with um, in, uh, care inspectors and, and, and other places about employers' responsibilities um, in terms of um, providing high standards of care or competent standards of care. And um, I don't think we've yet got that culture right in terms of how we do that measurement of standards. So we can rewrite the care standards, but if we're not um, uh, somehow empowering uh, that these standards are put into practice, then I think that we, we, we've got another task to do. And that still has to be addressed. I mean, I suppose you, when you talk about that inspection, when I, when I think about that, uh, the, the inspection regime uh, most recently has been in the acute settings and indeed residential yeah. homes. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, we had some discussion as a committee about when we move to you know, a higher level of care being delivered right across the community. Um, there is a, a, if we've got a big challenge now within uh, hospitals and residential settings, then the challenge within the community with all those numbers, you know, it, it, it's, it's, but, it's really a, a significant uh, But the real judges, there. the real judges for quality of care are the people who use the services. And how are we listening to them? And I think that there's a big issue about how easy it is for people who use services to actually make complaints, to actually not make just make complaints, but make observations to people who are actually charged with doing the inspections. And that level of communication, it takes you back to the Christie report, it takes you back to what's happening on the ground, and it's about how do people feel empowered to speak, to communicate with each other about the quality of care. Because if that doesn't happen at the ground level, um, it, you're going to continue to have incidents where people are not going to be well looked after. And I, and I think there's some real issue about how you empower people to communicate at that kind of, of, of level. So you can set your standards in gold, but if you're not listening to what's happening on the ground, 
mm. then it's, you, you're not going to achieve anything. Okay. Bob, did you want in? Yeah, just a, an over time's almost a, a, a pawn is convener. Um, I've listened carefully to, the, to various things, including the, the need to get the IT right. I've still got the scars on two committees in relation to waiting lists and uh, the track care system in Greater Glasgow in, in particular. And I, I listen, whilst this is not a commissioning bill, commissioning could have a greater role to play with it. And I've listened very carefully to some of the concerns in relation to, to commissioning. The, the key thing for the bill, of course, I suppose, is it's about compelling uh, local authorities and health boards where integration hasn't happened. And that's probably why, for some people around this table, it's a bit sparse, because it's, it's almost a, a bill to compel local areas where it hasn't happened, rather than a bill to dictate what that's, that, that's going to look like. Although I know causally, I think there's too much on the bill already, and I'd like us to strip some of it away. I think it's important to mention that. But it's actually, Mr Watson, I wanted to come in on. You said something which I thought was quite positive, which was in some... I, I know... Uh, I, won't, I wouldn't say it surprised me as well, but... Uh, um, you, 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 said, um, you said in local areas, uh, that's for sure, um, that, that some there's examples in local areas with people just getting on with it, and, and there is good practice taking place. This afternoon we're going to debate the keys to life, a learning disability strategy, and all over that is, uh, is health care and social care, and this afternoon is the time to debate that. Uh, and also mentioned in Glasgow this afternoon about when you don't include staff necessarily in service redesign, or service users, and we'll leave that sitting. But there's an example of another area where closer health and social care integration, you could just get on with it. So I'd be interested to know from the witnesses, a lot of the focus has been on adults, uh, elderly services and children's services. Are there other examples where you would like to see local authorities and health boards, of course with the stakeholders, just get on with it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think, um, that given our difficulties we've got in the bill, I think uh, I would be wary about leaping into new areas before we've sorted out the, uh, the, the, the current ones. So uh, I'm not advocating. I'm, uh, I find myself agreeing with the cause of submission too often. That's probably good for my career. Um, but, uh, but I did. Um, and I think they're, uh, they're, they're right in a lot, of those, uh, a, lot of, a lot of those areas. Interesting, the example I was uh, alluding to earlier was actually in learning disability. Um, actually, it was, uh, it, was, it, would, it was the learning disability teams um, that when a particular local authority and health board, not a million miles away from, from yourself, Bob, um, who, were, who were having a falling out uh, and you know, it was all over the newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I was down in one of those teams and I said, I said is this a problem? Eh, no, no. We just basically get on with it uh, and muddle through. But my point is that staff shouldn't have to get on with the muddle through. You know, it is possible to put frameworks in place. And I think it's about getting that balance right. Where we can do some use, we, I agree that this should be bottom up. I've said it several times. I agree with COSLA that it shouldn't be. You know, the problem about compelling is what are you compelling? You know, the, you know, the person in Edinburgh is telling everybody what to do is, is, is certainly not the way, at, way around this one. So I think that's, the, that's where I agree with COSLA in relation to the powers and we made a similar point in our evidence. But where I think from the sense you can help is in frameworks uh, and we talked about that in terms of care frameworks, in terms of standards and I'd also say as we said in our in our submission around staffing frameworks as well. You know all too often people around this room in particular those of us who have a trade union function spend their time reinventing the wheel with this type of public service reform. You know over staff transfers, over pensions, about the procedures. You know this may seem very boring mundane stuff but I'm afraid it's the stuff that causes disputes at local level, that causes difficulties. And what I hope you'll take from our uh, from evidence on this point is that we've set out what could be a useful national staffing framework, which then uh, educates local staffing frameworks, which stops us reinventing the wheel on some of these things and, and tackle some. It's not about deciding from the centre, but it is about setting out some common grounds. Otherwise, there are, you know, as, as, a, as a trade union lawyer, I can tell you, I can see dozens of potential legal difficulties with the bill as it currently stands in terms of staffing issues. Who made the decision? You know, when the hospital closes as a result of a budget change, who's made that decision uh, on that? Is it the employer? Is it the health board? Or is it this third party? You know, in terms of staff being seconded, have we worked out that? In terms of um, uh, staff who, uh, who, who, are, um, who, are, who are using different terms and conditions, have we sorted those issues out? The answer is no. They're mundane, but they're absolutely key to getting better uh, integration at the local level. 
again, we were in Highlands yesterday, and I you know, put some of that to them in terms of the, the industrial relations problem and the, the, the risk it was raised, I think, by Cosler and maybe others about um, uh, underwriting equal pay claims and everything else. And they, 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 they naively, maybe, it was health people we were speaking to, maybe, uh, we're, 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 we're discounting that level of, of risk. And the, and, and, and the practice there has been you know, free from that. Well, your, your experience might be different, and your, your reports yeah. back, it might be different, but it's important to put those on the record sure. If, sure. if that is the case. Yeah. I, 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 I caution two points on that. One is, of course, the Highland is not the body corporate model, and most of the legal difficulties that I'm highlighting come as a result of this unknown body corporate model. That's a straight staff transfer situation. You've got a clear employer. There are difficulties there, and in Highland, they haven't all been resolved, I'm sorry to say, and there are difficulties, and will continue to be difficulties, and we have to reinvent the wheel in countless hours and hours and hours of work in Highland just to get it to work at the time it happened. So it wasn't an easy process. All I'm really saying is, you know, do we want to reinvent that, you know, 32 times in the next few years? No need to do that, in my view. We're a small enough country to be able to do this, you know, on the, as, as part of a national framework. I don't want you to agree with Cosler again, but they, they actually, they actually, they, 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 they requested that the Scottish Government were underwriting any equal pay uh, well, Do you it, see that as a significant risk? Uh, well, there is equal pay is certainly one of them. Um, equality duty, equality impact assessment issues. Um, I, th I can see a whole range of issues there. Equal pay uh, could, could certainly be an issue. As, as the law currently stands, of course, we haven't sorted out the, the outstanding equal pay issues. That's another, another issue for another well, committee. committee. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, but, but health and local government still have some pretty outstanding cases. My desk groans with the number of legal cases. Uh, on that, so creating a, a new a new tranche, frankly, I think is something we'd all like to avoid. Can I, uh, Gabby? I'm not. Yes, go ahead, please. I'm going to make one more point about the, the sort of the rebit of the bill, because I think that just because you've got the two bodies being integrated, that doesn't stop you from integrating with other services. But I think what Rachel said was about time and about investing in your, your staff at the, at the, the roots who are going to be maybe having uh, the potential to be more creative with their services and, and to see it as a, as a broad thing, housing, mental health, children, education. I think there are so many opportunities, um, but I, think, I, I just see this as a step in the right direction. Well, on that note, you've got the last word, Gary. Um, can I thank you all for the written evidence provided and your, your appearance here today. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I close the committee at, at that.